The road has been long. Through time, Paratech has worked tirelessly to always keep innovating and making the best tools to save lives. Now, on the cusp of a new era, we are entering the future of rescue. Before facing the future, you should know the past. Let's go back. The real start to Paratech was the saw. Partners Robert Banker and Howard Liebwitz discovered the Swedish chainsaw that they thought would be effective for the fire service, and that proved to be correct. And that took off in all over the United States. It had to have special blades. Howie Leibovitz, he invented a negative pitch that nobody else could replicate, so we began making those ourselves. That's what gave us the manufacturing core to Paratech. We had this capability, and now we wanted to fulfill it with new products, new ideas, it all started back in 1962. Our first ever tool was the Pryax. The Pryax was uh, developed by a battalion chief in New York City Fire Department. All he had what he thought was a prototype for somebody to make it for him. This was while I was in the Army. My two partners, Howie and Bob, agreed that they'd like to try it. The first run was 2,000 units. When I got out of the Army in 1965, my first task was to get rid of these damn Pryaxes because they're costing us a fortune sitting here. Little by little, they gained recognition and we started building in improvements to the tool. And each time we made a release of forgings, we tried to incorporate a features into the tool that would make it better. Every change in the tool was an improvement. The tool that started it all over 50 years of continuous production and continuous improvements. World famous Pryax. From one innovation to another, Meet the hooligan tool. The fire departments had very limited choices. Some fire departments were doing forcible entry with a crowbar that they got at the Ace Hardware store. So when, they, when they'd when they see this quick and decisive forcible entry tool, that was a fairly quick success. And we did send thousands of them. We used to weld them, but the weld wasn't as good because it was damaging the structure of the material. So we pressed this. The first three-piece production Halligan tool and the first to improve upon the original Chief Halligan design. I designed new claw and new head, so it's more practical. Claw is more sleek, but it's bent more, and it has a nail pulling feature. The head, it had two wings like on the side of the pike. When you hit it in a metal lead in a car, you could twist and you open up the hole, so it become a completely different tool. And the hooligan tool has a major place now in fire departments. Recognizing the need for new, innovative firefighting tools, the Beal tool. Howie wanted to design this very small personal tool. Spell it backwards, it's Leib. Leib, Leibovic. That's what he wanted, so I had to do that. <laughs> he wanted to have a Beal tool. And that's the name. A few years ago, I redesigned that again. It's cast out of stainless. It's very strong, stronger than steel. It's like 180,000 PSI. All we do is put rubber handle on it. We just press it together, so this is like indestructible. The smallest, most portable ax in a fireman's arsenal. Designed by Paratech's founder, Howard Leibovitz, to ensure that even officers have a tool they can carry without restricting personal mobility. Something completely new, the PRT. He 
idea behind it. It's the economy of scale and it's safety because up until that time to get percussive force, you're swinging a sledgehammer and you take a back swing and it's dangerous. You're able to direct all the force. There's no deflection. I wanted to make it lighter and more modern. I developed one with the aluminum housing, so it was lighter, it was more efficient, and there was a special lock that when you turn, you can lock it in a different positions. All of the force that is being expended is directed at the point of the tool. The ultimate disaster preparedness tool. No strings attached. Safely direct optimum impact exactly where you want it. New problems require new tools. Titan Crash Axe. The lightest, most advanced personal rescue axe. Designed with and for the pararescuemen, the PJs, U.S. Air Force Special Operations Command. This was the first product I worked on. Some members of the, the Air Force pararescue guys had bought, um, had purchased one of our Beal tools and they had tested it without us knowing about it. And they said, hey, we really like this product. Here's the thing, we need the whole thing to be under two and a half pounds because everything that goes up in an airplane, the weight matters a lot. That's why you never drive to titanium. We started that project with full-size pencil sketches to clay models, to 3D models, to th like, man, I had, a, I had a whole Tupperware container full of 3D prints of just tweaking things and changing things, and the whole thing is skeletonized, kind of trellised out so that provide a, a really strong grip with gloves and gets the whole thing under that two and a half pound limit. Engineered to be as light, strong, and customizable as possible, the only X of its kind. Having refined our manufacturing and engineering expertise, we move to revolutionize another plane of rescue. Our road continues. The future of rescue still awaits. Come along next time when we uncover how Paratech made a yellow X mean the safest rescue. I went to work and I say, Howie, why did you hire me? And he said, because you're crazy. <laughs> I like guns. <laughs>
coming live out of California. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you to Paratech for giving us this opportunity to uh, offer our program up uh, for you guys out there to see. Um, again, uh, after this uh, presentation, if you guys need to get a hold of us, uh, blue collar TN at gmail.com. Right, we can take any questions or uh, you know have have little discussions. We're always down for that. Um, and then you can also get a hold of us on Facebook or Instagram and message us there, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, also on our website, um, any any of our class offerings is all on there, and you can all go through the platform there to uh, to reach out. Uh, we hope you enjoy the show, and uh, looking forward to your question and answers at the end of the the presentation. We're at it. So first part of the, uh, the program today is going to be the commercial vehicle anatomy, uh, basically emphasizing on the heavy vehicle side. Um, and we're going to go through some, some features of the trucks and trailers and things you guys may encounter. And then we'll get into our five-step process a little bit later. So again, enjoy the show and uh, here we go. So what is a commercial vehicle and or a heavy truck, All right? Uh, what what are you guys having in your area that's rolling down the road? Uh, what times of day, night, all those other good things? Uh, typical typical trucks that are going down and actually having wrecks and that we have to encounter out on the roadways. Uh, we'll be talking about some issues with the extrication itself. Right? <clears throat> are we actually going to have to get into a lift, or can we just stabilize, stop out the crush, and go to work with the smaller load underneath the heavier load? We're going to talk about different types of commercial vehicles, things that may be on them that can help us and or hurt us. Uh, design characteristics, what's coming to us in the future, um, what's already out there on the roads, and then the basic uh, overall anatomy. And then uh, we'll, we'll touch on some trailer anatomy, which actually has some pretty cool features on some of these trailers that are going down the road uh, that actually let us allow us to get a... Uh, quick, easy lift and uh, not really have to use too much special equipment that we carry on our rigs. So just a couple of statistics, about 41 to 45,000 deaths occur annually from crashes on the roadway, right? You guys can see in the slide there, 15% are pedestrians slash bike riders. Uh, we're, <clears throat> we're pretty fortunate, I guess not fortunate, but unfortunate, but we, in my department, we see a lot of vehicle versus pedestrians. Uh, so we've actually done a lot of training in our department to uh, get people up to speed and give them as many options as possible to uh, free those victims from underneath those uh, vehicles. Uh, you guys will see the 9% right involve commercial trucks, uh, but that 9% is going to actually equal into probably the most challenging extrication uh, that you encounter just due to the sheer weight of the vehicle itself and the energy that's being transferred from the big vehicle to the little vehicle or the little vehicle into the larger vehicle. Uh, about 80% of those, uh, the truck drivers are not at fault, right? They're uh, most often uh, a professional organizations that have professional drivers. Uh, so it's usually us in our smaller vehicles that get wrapped up into the commercial vehicle. So about 3.5 million registered professional drivers in the United States, right? 5.6 million of those trailers are registered with three times the trucks. Uh, 71% percent of all the freight in the U.S. is still moved by trucks, right? We got truck, rail, and ship. Uh, so we got a lot of stuff being moved around these uh, towns of ours that's being uh, distributed by a truck and trailer or truck in uh, itself. 91% uh, of those companies operate less than six trucks. So a lot of smaller outfit companies out there. Um, and then you got 97.3 of the companies operate less than 20 trucks. Uh, we'll give a shout out to JB Hunt, which is one of the largest trucking companies in the U.S. All right, 24,000 employees, 12,000 trucks, over 100,000 trailers. Uh, so big outfit, a lot of money in these uh, companies here. Uh, so you can think about that on the on the greater scale. There's just a huge investment in the trucking industry. Uh, so what is a heavy vehicle, right? <clears throat> Weighs more than 10,001 pounds. Um, a lot of federal DOT standards that come into the, the commercial vehicle world, um, but overall it's just 10,000 pounds. And when I say, and when we give you guys numbers in these presentations, we want you to think about that with the equipment that you guys carry. So what can handle 10,000 pounds and above? What can lift 10,000 pounds and above? 
vice versa, stabilize, capture, and all those other good things. Uh, could be a single unit or a combination unit, right? Truck to trailer or just a straight straight truck <clears throat> chassis there. Uh, combination unit right, usually consists of a tractor pulling one or more trailers, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later. And then usually the maximum permitted length in the States is about 53 feet <clears throat> okay, on a trailer. Uh, tractors pulling more than two 28-foot uh, trailers known as the Twins or your Western Doubles. Uh, you see that a lot out on the West Coast, uh, especially in uh, Arizona, Nevada, things like that. Uh, you'll see the smaller pup trailers uh, so they can drop one off continue their uh, deliveries and then come back and they'll pick them up on their way back. Uh, unless permitted, right? And then we got another big number here, no more than 80,000 pounds. Okay? So it just seems to be the, uh, the going weight um, for the U.S. You get up into the Pacific Northwest and you may see higher numbers, 105, 110 um, for a maximum uh, weight without a permit. Uh, but usually 80,000 is right around that magic number. So a lot of weight, right? But if we actually tackle this thing um, and break it down, it's pretty easy to manage. Heavy trucks may have as many as seven axles, right? And in most states, each axle has about a weight of 20,000 pounds that it can carry. Right? So with permits, a seven axle truck can actually carry over 140,000 pounds, right? And overall length can be more than 70 feet. So large mass going down the road, Usually, sometimes these guys are breaking the speed limits. Um, we're pretty fortunate here in California. You know, we got the 55 mile an hour speed limit. So if you've ever driven in California, you probably hate it. Uh, but it does seem to work to uh, limit the uh, amount of uh, uh, tragedy, I guess, and or um, intrusion and stuff like that when these things do wreck. Uh, standard height, 13 foot, 6 inches, right? So now we're taking our passenger your vehicle world and we're just making it bigger so it's longer heavier and taller so we got to think about that when it comes to all of our stabilization techniques and or lifting stuff uh, we're going to break it down into a couple of three uh, categories of trucks right you got your straight truck which is just going to be your straight chassis engine transmission axle suspension all on one one truck uh, whether it has a box a box on the back of it and or a specialty a flatbed or something like that um, then obviously your tractor trailer, right? Two separate units that couple together. Um, and we'll break that down here a little bit later on different types of tractors and trailers. And then you have your specialty vehicles, uh, cement trucks, cement mixers, fire trucks, uh, concrete pumpers, um, things like that, that are just specialty. And then that's where you're going to start seeing your, uh, your weights of the vehicles go through the roof, um, and specialty axles, things like that are, that are attached to. So there's a couple of examples of a straight truck, right? Your uh, bobtails or your delivery trucks. Um, and most commonly, you probably see these with the U-Haul sticker on the side of them or a rider rider, uh, rider truck for the, uh, the old person to get out there and just move some things around. Um, but these are pretty common, um, smaller deliveries, right? So the bigger trucks will come in and these will pick them up and, and go off to the, uh, the smaller businesses and things like that. <clears throat> Uh, cargo vans, things like that, uh, 19 five to 33,000 pounds, right? So big, large, straight vehicles that have a lot of weight in them. Uh, your tractor trailer, again, right? Two separate units, tractor and a cargo trailer, depending on what kind of trailer. Um, the average tractor, which is the drive unit, weighs about 15,000 pounds to 18,000 pounds. And then again, the combined unit, combined weight of the unit, upwards of 80,000 pounds without permit. Uh, the overall length 65 feet long. So again, long, tall, and heavy is what we're after here. And then obviously your uh, specialty trucks, right? Your mixers, your fire trucks. I challenge you guys to go back and actually find out the the gross vehicle weight per axle on your fire trucks. You'd be surprised on what those things, what we're asking those things to carry. Um, uh, your wider front tires, you know, obviously have a greater capacity on them versus your skinny tires. So you'll notice on these types of trucks here is in the picture, they're going to have that fatter front tire. So 20,000 to 25,000 pounds on a steering axle is a lot of weight. Uh, we'll break down some definitions, right? Your GVW gross vehicle weight is the actual weight and it changes with the load. Okay. And your GVWR, so your curb weight, 
additional equipment, the weight of the cargo, the passengers, and then it's the limit. Uh, the tear weight, you guys have probably heard that, or your EVW is the weight of the vehicle or empty container. So tear weights will probably see on more likely on shipping containers. They're going to give you a tear weight and then a maximum capacity on their GVWR. Uh, DOT weight classification is going to break it down class one through nine. And by no means am I expecting you guys to remember all this stuff, um, but just have that that awareness of these different classes when you guys see it. Um, it's all in your ERGs, um, so it actually breaks down your pictographs and your classes on your trucks, and you guys will have a good uh, way of finding out how much those things could possibly weigh. There's a good example on the dump truck here, right? Your tear weight is 26.4 with your GVWR of 66.15. And notice the amount of axles on this picture here. You got your steering axle with the front a uh, wide front tire, right? 20, 25, depending on what it is. And then you have your set of uh, duels in the back, right? 34,000 pounds. Um, and actually you could put up to upwards of 20 per. So uh, 40,000 pounds on that dual configuration. And then you also have the uh, your drop axles just in front of those for that extra weight when that dump truck is fully loaded. So a lot going on here, big, heavy rock truck, right? Lots of weight, <clears throat> unsecured load in the back. Um, so again, big numbers that we could, could encounter. We'll break down these classes here real quick. Uh, you got your little van there on the top and then a little bit of a box truck, class one, you know, zero to 6,000 pounds, class two GBW, 6,001 to 10, class three, 10, one to 14, it's your light trucks, passenger vans, smaller ambulances, utility vehicles, things like that. Uh, your class four, 14,001 to 16, class five, 16 to 19,5, and then you get into that class six, which is 19,5,1 to 26,000 pounds. Okay. Medium trucks, small buses, um, you start getting into the dual axles now in the rear versus the single axle. And then our last two classes, all right, class seven is 26,1 to 33,000 pounds. And then the big boy at the end, class eight, 33,001 pounds and above. Okay, so there's a big gap there in that class eight. So 331 all the way up to 80 plus, right? Um, it's a huge jump there. But again, we just got to understand what we're dealing with and how we can break these things down. Two axle highway tractors, dump trucks, our ladder trucks, heavier trucks, tow trucks, um, all things of that nature that are just big big masses and a lot of weight and a lot of moving power basically going down the road. Uh, there's the pictographs we were talking about earlier, right? Gives you your class seven, your class eight, <clears throat> gives you a couple good descriptions of what you possibly could encounter. Um, so that's a good little reference there. Tow trucks, you can see there, trash trucks. Uh, I like this picture here, this is a good one. Uh, so your federal DLT, Right, gives you your max gross vehicle weight, 80,000 pounds. So if we actually break it down per axle, which is a great way to uh, come up with a number that we may be dealing with out on the street when we get when we get called to these wrecks, right? So a skinny tire on the front, 12,000 pounds. You'll probably hear us if you've been to one of our classes, 12 to 18, just depending on what's going on and what kind of tractor that is. And then you got the good reference here for when you get into the set of duels. So you get 17,000 per axle or a combination of 34,000. So and if we add those up, right, 34, 34, and 12, that gives us that magic number of 80. And the reason we're doing that is some people will say, well, yeah, you know, you gave us a, an actual single axle weight capacity of 20,000 pounds. Yeah, so we can do that. But in this configuration here in these duels, which is pretty standard throughout the US, is when I separate the distance between those two sets of duels, that allows me to put the full 20,000 pounds on each axle. So you'll see as you guys are going down the road and you see these trucks driving driving next to you, you'll see a significant gap uh, difference between the two sets of axles. That's where you know you actually you can actually put the 20,000 pounds per axle on each one of those. Uh, but this is federal DOT, right? This is what they look for. It's special configuration with the distance and the measurement, only allowing you to put 34,000 pounds on these things. <clears throat> 
So if we break this down a little bit more, you can see here in the axle loading, right? So we'll give 12,000 pounds to the first picture on the left, right? For the steering axle. And then we'll give a single 20,000 pounds max on that single configuration for a total of 32,000 pounds on that box truck. And then if we swing back to the one on the right, again, we still got a skinny tire, 12,000 pounds steering axle. And then we got 17 per or 34 total. And then you add those two together and it gives us 46,000 pounds overall that could potentially be in there that we're dealing with, right? Um, and we'll break that down a little bit further later on in the five-step process and how to, how to fix that. So truck design features, right? There's a lot of people that take a lot of pride in these trucks, uh, especially the private owners. Uh, so a ton of features on these things. We're gonna break them down a little bit further here. Not get into all of them, um, but there's a lot of stuff on these trucks that can either hurt us or help us um, when we're actually rolling up on scene and going to work on some of these. So the truck pulling a cargo trailer is called the tractor, right? There's lots of different cabs, which we'll break down here in a minute. Uh, full frame design, just like our old school cars, uh, chassis, cross members, and suspension components, right? All attached to that. Uh, the cab is mounted usually on four to six um, attachment points. And then a lot of them have air, air ride on the cabs now too. So you have a floating cab basically. Uh, so we've got to look for those things if we're going to actually use them to stabilize. Standard tractor weighs about 14 to 18,000 pounds. So a uh, big jump from the passenger vehicle world where we're usually dealing with cars right around 3,500, 4,000 pounds. Um, and then we jump all the way up to 14,000 pounds with just a tractor alone. It's a huge gap, um, but we do have tools that we can use to uh, tackle these, these evolutions here. Um, you can see a couple pictures here, right? You can see that full frame design there, cross members, two frame rails. Um, this, these actually have a, a fifth wheel on the back too, right? And then all of our suspension components and then our, our cab and so forth bolted onto that big steel structure, right? Full of airlines, electrical components, things like that. <clears throat> you look at the picture on the right, yeah, you can see that tractor that used to be. Um, so a lot of superficial stuff that looks big and cool, um, but they do tear apart pretty easily. Um, we've actually had uh, commercial vehicle engines 200 feet away just stripped right out of the frame um, when these things wreck. So a lot of violence that occurs when these things crash um, just due to the sheer mass and <clears throat> the energy that happens when these things do crash. So and we'll break those down a little bit. Uh, tractors driving without a trailer are called bobtail units, right? So you can ask any truck driver. Um, they like having the trailer and they also like having their trailer full when they're driving it. <clears throat> Empty trailers are not fun to drive with. Um, they move around quite a bit, especially in the wind. Um, and then uh, the metal is usually a heavier gauge metal than passenger vehicles, okay? But the strength and the, the engineering of the commercial vehicle just has not even come close to what the passenger vehicle world is doing with the uh, ultra high strength steels and things like that. Uh, when, the only reason I can think of is basically due to the sheer height, right? So we've moved that passenger of the of the commercial vehicle up higher away from all that side intrusion and all that. Um, so I just don't think they've caught up to it yet. Um, and then a lot of newer tractors, they use fiberglass, right? You'll see all that fiberglass wrap around the vehicle and then the heavier gauge steel underneath and reinforced where they need it. Uh, so it looks big and cool, but it's really just fiberglass. We can get in there and cut some of that stuff out and get to, get to the hard points. Um, access the metal that needs to be pushed or, or cut and uh, free our victims out of that. Um, the two types of tractors that you guys are probably most common, commonly you're dealing with is your conventional cab and then your old school cab over where your the driver was actually sitting on top of the engine and transmission. And then that cab hinged forward for you to access uh, fluids and things like that. Um, and we'll break those down here. So there's a good picture of a conventional cab. Right, it's got the two seats in the front. This one has a huge sleeper on the rear, and this is actually a quick swap um, tow truck. So um, again, length, right? Engine in front, so they have a lot of protection that driver does out in front. Good four or five feet. Uh, you would have to actually have to push that front of the or the nose of that truck back into the passenger space. Uh, so they are pretty well protected unless they're doing 80 miles an hour with 80,000 pounds and comes in a abrupt stop. Um, so again, they've been around for a long time, right? <clears throat> and then they're built to last a long time. I think, uh, 
I think Prevost has that million mile chassis out there. They, they build those, um, those pretty sweet uh, buses and or motorhomes. Uh, so again, these trucks are designed to last a long time and just change out the smaller components underneath uh, that have, have everyday wear and tear. Uh, there's your cab over tractor, uh, <clears throat> old school. Shouldn't see too many of those out anymore, especially in California. Uh, we got a a weird uh, smog deal going on here. So they're pretty much eliminating all these older trucks out here in California. They all have to have death and all that. So you shouldn't see too many of these uh, anymore. Um, the, cab, the cab again is positioned directly over the engine. Okay. So not a lot of interior space. Um, they may have a little sleeper in the back they may not just depends on what's going on and then again the driver is sitting inches away from the front of the tractor so when these types of trucks crash uh, the intrusion into the passenger space is, is highly um, exemplified <clears throat> and this is when we start getting in there we got to do a lot of pushing and cutting and spreading to get the drivers and or the passenger out of these types of commercial vehicles out Uh, sleepers, okay, they can be built with all different kinds of configurations. Uh, a lot of these drivers, right, uh, they, they go from coast to coast. Uh, obviously, they have hour regulations and things like that. But uh, I can tell you from uh, some personal experience, there's a lot of features inside these sleepers here that we've got to be aware of, okay? So you're talking everything from a 800-square apartment <clears throat> and putting it in behind a truck and the driver they pretty much live in these things, you know, year round and it's all in there. So everything you could have in your house, kitchen, bathroom, it's all has a potential to be in that sleeper. So um, be aware of that. Um, not, not too much of a concern, but uh, I always, I usually like to use the term uh, yard sale when these things crash, because all that stuff comes forward into the pasture space where we're trying to work. And it's a pretty uh, messy situation. <clears throat> Uh, we'll see here. You can see the lower picture here. Uh, these are probably going to be your um, your beacons, your uh, you know your moving companies that move from coast to coast. Okay, so pretty elaborate, uh, almost like a travel trailer behind that driving cab. Um, again, so gray water, uh, black water, everything you can think of. Again, in your apartment, that's pretty much going to be what you're dealing with on that one. <clears throat> Um, overall access, uh, pretty easy again, right? Just think of your RV or your uh, your travel trailer, um, lightweight fiberglass with some insulation and then your, your reinforcement steel under those uh, precise locations. So we can get in there pretty easily, um, but just remember all the other things. So bigger masses and, and things like that. And then also unrestrained pa uh, passengers, right? So if they're tag team drivers, they got one drive in, one sleep in. And then when that driver times out, they can swap and keep the load going. Um, so a lot of unrestrained passengers um, and also be aware of uh, the children too. So a lot of families um, will go with their with their parents when they drive. So we got to uh, do a nice thorough sweep of the cab, right? Um, and make sure everybody's accounted for um, and we don't miss anybody in there. Just a couple more pictures there. You can see it. I mean, it's textbook. It looks like your your travel trailer. It's got stove, uh, oven, microwave. Uh, you name it. It's all in there. Pretty pretty nice nice rigs here. Uh, aerodynamics. You guys have probably seen this if you've been paying attention to the trucking world over the last years or so. Um, they're filling in a lot of void space with the uh, fairings, <clears throat> basically deflecting air. Okay, so if you look here, the Freight Liner Corporation conducted a study and determined that at 60 miles an hour, it took 186 horsepower to move a, a modern tractor trailer down the road. Okay, so the power used was 52% or 97% horsepower. So that drag that's being created with all those void spaces that are in these big boxes, in, in essence, um, it's a problem, right? So when we're talking about freight being moved in the U.S. via truck, right, it costs it's all about fuel, right? Fuel mileage and then weight. So if I can lighten the trailer, lighten the tractor, fill in all these voids to make it more aerodynamic and get my load down the road faster and more efficient, then it's more money for the trucking industry, cheaper for the people that are shipping it and or receiving it. Uh, so a lot of things going on in the trucking world. 
Um, and there's a lot of technology that's being pushed, but I just don't know when we're going to see it. Um, basically just because a lot of, um, private owners, right? So you, when you tell somebody they have to add this or add that to their truck to make it more efficient, um, it all costs money. So, um, the bigger companies, yeah, they'll, they'll prevail here, right? Cause they'll, they'll get all the, uh, kickbacks and all that other good stuff, but basically just trying to prevent drag. Um, and, uh, if you've ever driven behind one of these things on the freeway, you know, that you get a, pretty much get a free ride, uh, almost like they do in NASCAR when they're drafting. So, um, a lot of cool stuff out there, but I just don't know when we're going to see it, uh, carte blanche and basically every trailer manufacturer or tractor manufacturer just buy off on it and start, um, incorporating it into their, uh, their vehicles uh windshields right nothing fancy here folks um big large windshields uh, very easy for access so when you think about access egress while trying to get into these things look for your windows right your windshields are going to be lam uh, laminated glass right and they all have that big fat rubber seal around the sides okay and it has that emergency access bead that's right in the center of it if you've been to our class, you just got to stab that out and pull it and you can pull the whole uh, unit of glass out. Um, if you've ever been to our classes too, we don't like cutting glass because of all the dust and all that. So you got to do what you got to do. We're not saying here, uh, telling you can't cut glass, but we just like to avoid it if we can. And also that glass protects the victims inside. So if it, if it can stay and not hinder your operation, just leave it alone. Um, and then we'll have the side windows Obviously, they're going to be made of tempered glass, so they break into a million little pieces and create a mess on your scene. Um, but glass is an issue, but really not too much of an issue once we actually think about what we're doing here. Um, and again, I like the large openings for access. Um, you'll see here on these uh, newer ones, the top uh, the top left pictures there. Those are your the newest uh, Tesla um, ele all electric tractors. Yeah, uh, very aerodynamic. Um, the thing I have not got out from them yet is because it's not even on the street. It's just doing around doing some beta testing is the overall weight. So we took that, I want to say it was what, 16 to 18,000 pounds on that uh, statistic earlier of a normal tractor weight. But now all that stuff is gone. And now I got battery weight. All my drive motors are electric. So I got a ton of difference in the weight here just based off components. Um, but I don't know what those numbers are going to look like yet. Uh, so it could be through the roof. We don't know. Um, but just something to be looking for uh, center drive there, right? So you got the, uh, the helm is at the center of the, of the tractor on the Tesla. Um, maybe we see them, maybe we won't, I don't know. Uh, but again, it's all driven by that money. So that's the magic thing here in the trucking industry that we'll see how this technology comes into the commercial world. Um, and then that bottom lower right picture, again, large opening, right? Just big, large opening and lets us get in and out <clears throat> pretty easily. Uh, the roofs, again, okay, medium, heavy trucks, <clears throat> usually covered with the lightest gauge, metal or fiberglass, right? Okay, the skin is supported by two or more, more ribs or that skeleton technology. So uh, a lot of metal underneath that lightweight stuff in crucial places. And then we'll uh, distribute the... Uh, the reinforced area is where we need it. You know, your lower A post, your A post, B post, things like that. Um, and then it's just covered by all that fiberglass or lightweight metal. Um, the fairing or the, the large roof mount uh, wind diversion, right? To bring that wind up over the tractor and then carry it over the tractor or the trailer, excuse me. Um, that's what we're looking for there. So they have that, so they can just make that continuous um, and, and make that wind shed off that unit. Okay. You can see there that top right picture. I, I, we call that a day cab, right? So it's an eight hour, 10 hour max uh, truck. So they're only running around for half the day and then they're done. Okay. Um, that top left and the bottom right, those are have the sleepers on them. So those guys could be, you know, traveling from coast to coast potentially. Um, you can see the different deflectors there um, versus the ones on the day cabs. They just have that little, fa little fairing on top um, versus the uh, sleeper cabs. It's actually incorporated into the uh, tractor itself and the sleeper berth and all that. Just a big fiberglass cone or cap that goes on top of it. 
<clears throat> cab doors, okay, uh, heavy truck designed to fit flush in the frame so that just almost like your passenger vehicles, um, it's a tight fitting. Okay? It makes access to the door very difficult, uh, but your, your tr traditional cut spread that you do on passenger vehicles is going to allow you to make access into these doors. Um, internal parts, your latch, latch mechanism, that old school, you pull the latch, it moves a rod. Okay? Those are all just inside that door, and that outer skin, um, very easy to access and manipulate um, latches and things like that if they're just jammed up a little bit. Uh, the two common types, right? You're going to have that uh, standard uh, piano hinge. You can see it in the uh, on the left side of the front of the door there, right? <clears throat> Exterior mounted uh, piano hinge. And then you're going to have the flush mount here with the actual hinges inside the, um, the jam there. So piano hinges, uh, pretty easy. You know, get your air chisel out. Um, it's a great tool. Uh, you know, we always get those, those uh, questions being brought up of, uh, well, what was the last time you used the air chisel? Well, <clears throat> you know, that's the business we're in in the fire department. We, we put enough stuff on these rigs for the what if, um, because every tool works differently and every wreck is differently. So um, air chisel works great on piano hinges. Just zip it off and uh, you can come in that side or you can go with your traditional um, spreads and, and, and uh, pushes and cuts with your hydraulic tools there too. Uh, steering wheel, this, this, this is a great uh, great slide here, right? Um, larger in diameter. Back in the old days, the steering wheels used to be very large. Um, and then what was that for? I.e. it was for leverage, right? So we had a big truck and we needed a larger diameter steering wheel to actually get that steering axle to turn. Okay? Um, over the years, you know, power steering was uh, developed, um, but you will still commonly find a larger steering wheel on a commercial truck than you would a passenger vehicle. Um, the reason we don't want to talk about that is the driver may have just been pinned in by the steering wheel. So um, that lower half moon of the steering wheel, you can see there's a good six, eight inches on some of these steering wheels. Well, maybe all we have to do is go in there and cut that bottom hoop off the steering wheel. It allows us enough space to get that victim up and out, um, <clears throat> tilt the columns, things like that. Uh, but again, it just fills up the passenger space a lot uh, or greater than it would in a passenger vehicle. Uh, so we have a lot of options with steering wheels here to make space for uh, for us to get in there and make access to victims. Tilt steering, all that other good stuff, right? Um, it's all been there. So think about the small little things we can do before we actually have to get in there and start pushing and, and pulling and stuff with chains. Uh, another great tool, uh, air ride seats. Um, <clears throat> the reason I bring this up is we had this we had a call here once. Uh, you know, big rig jackknife off the side of the freeway overturned obviously fuel everywhere. So it was just a big mess. Um, and we actually <clears throat> went in there and all we had to do was lower the air out of the seat, the air ride seat. And we cut the bottom hoop off the uh, steering wheel and we pulled the dude out and got him off to the hospital in a matter of seconds. Uh, so again, features that are in the truck that are there, as long as we understand how to use them and which way they, and how they operate, um, we can make quick work of some of these calls. Uh, wheel types, <clears throat> okay, you shouldn't see these ones on the right too much anymore. Um, your split rims, okay, very dangerous, right, especially if they're damaged. Um, if anybody's ever changed tires out for a living in the commercial world, uh, these things violently uh, separate. Um, so we want to be cautious of those things, right? Um, so when you guys roll up to these scenes and you start looking at this uh, this truck here to uh, identify the load or, or see what's going on, we're gonna take a look at that stuff and make sure it looks like it's supposed to. Um, it doesn't look like it's bent or trying to come off. Um, and then just be aware of it and let everybody else know. And then your, your typical rims here on the left, right? Bud rims, you see them everywhere. Most of our fire rigs have them, um, probably made by Alcoa. Um, nice shiny rims, right? <clears throat> um, all aluminum, okay? So, and they hold a lot of weight. Uh, we got some brakes that we might have to deal with, right? Medium and heavy trucks um, cooked with either hydraulic brakes or air brakes or a combination of the two. Um, hydraulic brake systems are similar to autos, right? It has to go through a cylinder or master cylinder. Um, and then usually the rear brakes will be air on some of these commercial trucks and the front will be hydraulic. Um, some trucks um, are basically uh, assisted with, uh, or sorry, the uh, hydraulic brakes are assisted with air pressure. Right, and then your class eight trucks are all equipped with air brake systems. So 
we're going to talk, we're going to dive into air brakes here a little bit more um, because there's some cool features on them. We may have to actually release those brakes to move a unit, you know, back forward or, or whatever we need to do to make some space. Uh, so obviously the engine spins a compressor on the, on the truck, you know, provides about 120 to 130 pounds of pressure and it's regulated by a governor. And then it, the air is supplied to the system through lines, tanks, terminating the spring brake chambers, <clears throat> um, all sorts of other things, you know, the pneumatic components of the truck actually open and close the fan clutch on some of these things. So the air is just predominantly surrounding these vehicles. So it could hurt us and it could help us, but we'll talk about some of those things here in a minute. Uh, so air pressure is used to keep the brakes disengaged, right? You guys all know about those, uh, uh, the spring brakes on the rear of our trucks. Okay, so <clears throat> um, when you drain the air out of your, you, bleed, you do your, your air checks in the morning, right? You bleed all the air out and then your spring brake engages and locks the truck for safety measures. Okay, uh, your air system pressure is 40 to 60, automatically engages the brakes, just depending on how old the vehicle is. And then the air is supplied to the trailer <clears throat> from the tractor through a set of flexible hoses called glad hands. Uh, so you'll have a red and a blue line, right? And <clears throat> we'll dive into that here. Um, but we're basically taking the, the air from the tractor and sending it back to the trailer to use the pneumatic features of the trailer. So whether it's brakes, um, bogey pin releases, uh, airbags for air ride on the trailer, there's a, a, a couple different things on there that it could be used for. Um, so flexible hoses that we talked about, the uh, glad hands, right? They're gonna be color coded. Red is gonna be for the emergency side. And the blue is the service side. So basically to make it easy on you, the red is for an emergency okay, and any auxiliary features that are on that trailer, i.e. air ride suspension, bogey pin releases. And the blue is simply just you stepping on the gas or the brake pedal inside the tractor and applying the brakes to the rear of the trailer at the same time. Pretty much the easiest way to explain it. Uh, so it may be necessary to move a truck, right? So we get there, you know, we always heard these, these, you know, never move a vehicle with somebody in it. Yeah. Well, sometimes you're going to have to, when you break down the scene and you look at the options, yeah, if I'm failing miserably over here on one side, um, because I don't want to move a vehicle with somebody in it <clears throat> um, versus me moving it, taking 10 seconds to move it and then having 360 degrees to work on this thing, uh, we're probably going to move the vehicle. So we may have to understand how some of this stuff works, right? So if the brakes are engaged, we may have to go into the tractor, which would be the easiest if it's all still intact and just release the yellow and the red knob for the trailer and the yellow for the tractor. And we could move, potentially move the tractor and or trailer or separate the two if we need to. Okay. Um, and again, if you've been to our class, you'll see here, you know, seek advice from a mechanic or a tow truck driver, okay? A heavy tow truck driver. Um, these folks do this stuff all day, every day. So they have a very in-depth knowledge of air brake systems, uh, caging brakes. So you're actually manually um, releasing those brake pods with a cage bolt and a wrench and, and or impact gun if you're a tow truck driver. <laughs> um, like I said, if you don't know how to do it, we highly recommend not doing it on the road. So uh, the Tow trucks are key to this uh, to this program. We highly promote them throughout every one of our classes. Um, it is a great, great resource. And um, again, if anything, it just brings us a, a ton of uh, equipment to the scene for us. Uh, uh, so then never attempt to disassemble a brake chamber, right? Look at those brake pods. Those things come off violently. There's a lot of energy stored in those things too. Remember it's spring compressed. So if those things look damaged, paint it orange, do something, just let everybody know to stay away from it um, because we don't want that thing to uh, violently uh, come apart and, and hit one of us. Uh, a couple of uh, examples of brakes here, right? You'll see that top left picture is your dual chamber. So it has a service brake and a spring brake in it. Okay, versus the uh, picture on the lower left there, right? That's, you'll probably typically see those on your front steering axles. That's just a brake, right? It's just when I put my foot on the brake pedal, it's just a brake being applied. And then it has a spring release, a return spring. Um, you can see the size and magnitude of those brakes, right? In that upper right picture there, uh, the drum, a lot of disc brakes out there now, but just a lot of mass in the in the brake systems on these trucks. Okay, so again, it's trying to potentially stop 80,000 pounds. Uh, so everything is just going to be bigger and magnified versus that passenger vehicle world. 
There's a great picture of the glad hands there coming from the tractor to the trailer. You'll notice the red and the blue hoses and the, the attachments. Okay. And then your, your green line below that is your, um, your 12 volt system that's going back to the, the trailer itself. Some may have a PTO connection. So you may have hydraulic connections coming from your tractor, your drive unit to your trailer to, to operate some hydraulic features. Um, and then you can see the, uh, trailer air supply red knob remember red for trailer um good picture of that that's in the tractor itself there too uh suspension right so it is 2021 so pretty much all these trucks driving on the road should be riding on air ride um, unless you got an older truck that has the leaf packs and the springs and all that um, but if you take a picture of the, or a good look at that picture there on the, the left there you can see the size of that airbag okay so almost like a four link suspension where that those arms and that axle are traveling up and down and they're controlled by the, uh, the, the two airbags that are linked together there for the ride height. Um, some are adjustable inside the cab, some are on auto levelers. Um, and we can talk about that here. I think there's a good picture of it here in a little bit. Um, but a lot of air components going on. Um, but again, if you look at the overall travel of that airbag, it's gonna go up and down. So I could potentially move the vehicle height of the tractor and or trailer in an upward and downward motion just by taking over the air system <clears throat> excuse me on the uh on the truck and tractor so on the truck and trailer so all right there's a good picture of it right there so on the back of a the trailer there so it's got the dual axles right 34,000 pounds that it can hold so it has a total of four four airbags that are controlling the ride height there. So right in the middle there, you can kind of see the red line going into that valve. Um, <clears throat> so that air comes from the compressor back through the glad hands all the way into the trailer and then inflates these um, the airbags. This will be on the red side of the feature of the uh, um, glad hand attachments. Okay, So the blue side has nothing to do with the air ride suspension. So controls the ride height. Okay, so basically an airbag, we use airbags, right? Paratech makes airbags um, to lift and lower, right? So same feature, it just fills up with air and it has uh, some capacity to lift things. Weight is most what we're looking for here. And there's that auto level um, gauge or uh, level where I was talking about there. So you can see that nice shiny rod there. It's usually attached to the axle. And then it goes up to that um, float switch, which is that upper little bent arm on that switch. Okay, so as that truck and or trailer rides down the road, it's letting air in and taking air out, keeping things nice and level. Okay, so we're just gonna go in there and simply snip that, or if you wanna be nice, you can unbolt it and turn that valve into an, a raise and a lower. <clears throat> so I can add air to the, the airbags, lift the trailer and or tractor, or I can let air out and lower things. So a cool little feature that's just sitting there waiting for us, as long as we understand how things are gonna react when we go to use those. Uh, fuel types, right, predominantly diesel. Okay? We're just gonna take that magnitude and, and, and make it bigger, right? So 150 gallons per tank, usually have two tanks. So a lot of fuel, style tanks is the common terminology. Um, you know, diesel fuel on the on the scene is, <clears throat> is, is inherently dangerous, I guess, to a point. Uh, um, but if we all understand basic fire dynamics, it's pretty hard to light diesel unless it's mixed with copious amounts of gasoline. Uh, so a diesel spell is not really a concern to me as long as we mitigate it and we let everybody know that it's occurring. Uh, we have these cool little kiddie pools that we can throw underneath them um, in our organization. They're just rigid pools. You throw them underneath there, all the fuel can go in there. Caltrans will come up and uh, pick them up, <clears throat> offload it and give us a new pool. So think about your options hook up with your Department of Transportation folks, see what kind of tools they have, uh, great resources there. And is it leaking because the uh, the saddle tank uh, attachment is damaged, right? Can I just lift it back up and resecure it and stop it from leaking? Well, let's, let's take care of it. Uh, alternative fuels, right? That's the old, uh, that's the biggest thing going around town right now. So it was hydrogen, LNG, CNG. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there, there's a lot of, uh, the word I'm looking for here. Uh, not alternative fuels, but uh, anyway, we'll talk. A, a slide will pop up here in a minute. Um, 
but they're out there, right? So they all, they all should be clearly labeled. You can see the blue diamond from here in the slide, right? It's telling me something's off, okay? Uh, what kind of fuel am I actually dealing with? Um, then we'll touch, get into the Tesla, right? All electric, 300 to 500 mile range is what they're proposing. The thing that I like to talk about here is the zero to 60 in 20 seconds with 80,000 pounds. That's a game changer. So um, again, right now we have those drive units or those electric motors that are right to the wheels. This thing's gonna get up and go. Uh, and the only other thing that um, basically makes me not like it is the $200,000 mark. Okay? So again, think about these private uh, truck drivers. Are they going to want to spend that money to only get 500 miles? We'll see. It's going to be a, a, a Vegas token that we're all looking for. So if you put your bet out there, uh, you might get lucky. Uh, autopilot feature. Again, I'm not a fan of anything that has to do with autopilots in vehicles. Uh, we're just not there. The Jetsons are not here yet, so um, people die when we have autopilots, but that's just my take on it. Um, I still want somebody back there, especially when it's doing 80 miles an hour with 80,000 pounds on, uh, behind it. So um, we want to rely on somebody professional back there if we can. Low, C, uh, low CG, right? So all that mass and the weight is going to be very low on these, uh, these newer electric vehicles. So it could be good, could be bad, just things to be aware of when we uh, start lifting these things or moving them around uh, there's another one made by nicola motor company hydrogen electric 800 volt fuel cell 1200 miles between phillips yeah i'm liking that all right 20 miles a gallon with zero emissions california is gonna like that and 100 percent emissions free uh, the lower picture there is another company out of la thor trucks all right, so a lot of cool stuff that's being thought of. I just don't know when we're going to see it based off the cost, in my mind. Oh, the fifth wheel, right? That's what attaches the tractor to the trailer. Yeah, it's a nice little landing pad there. Um, it was invented in 1919 by John Endebrock. Yeah, it comes from when trucks only had four wheels. So how can we maneuver these big things around? Well, there you go. They invented the fifth wheel a long time ago. And so some, some good features here in the fifth wheel that we'll talk about that can help us in these uh, in these rigs or these uh, accidents. Uh, some trailer anatomy, yeah, right there. You got a nice van trailer and that one is a reefer unit. So it's cold, okay. Uh, different sizes, shapes, okay. When they're not coupled to the tractor, uh, the front end is supported by a small pair of wheels or plates called the landing gear. So. Um, if you guys remember in our classes, those jacks that are in the front of the trailer, they go up and down, right? So we can actually separate the two vehicles um, <clears throat> and hold the load of the trailer. Okay? Only tra trailers with landing gear are low bed and pull trailers, okay? And then under the front of every trailer, there's a kingpin. So that big pin that locks into the fifth wheel um, holds a lot of stress there, okay? And we'll talk about that here in a minute. There's a good picture of it right there. So that big old shank there that's hanging down, <clears throat> um, this area of the trailer is of, is of great concern to us. Um, not, not on the side of um, hurting us, but on the side of helping us. So that's about quarter inch plate steel on the front, front nose of that trailer with the kingpin there. Great area for lifting, stabilizing, stopping the crush, all that. There's a lot of mass there of steel and it's a great, great spot for us to do some work. Um, you can see the two jacks uh, just behind that there, that's your landing gear, okay? They work in unison. The jacks go down together and they come up together with two speeds. It is a loaded speed, what I call, when the trailer is loaded, so it's nice and slow and it's easy to turn. And then there's a uh, take up space speed. So when the jacks are high and I wanna get them to the ground fast, okay, I'm just filling that void. <clears throat> so it's got a, a higher speed ratio um, and it travels that uh, faster to fill up that void. And then once you make contact with the ground, then you can sh shift gears and actually put the load on it, make it nice. Now, uh, there's another great example of a flatbed trailer coming back up onto the uh, the fifth wheel and the kingpin aligning in and then latching in. Okay. <clears throat> a lot of different types of trailers out there, shapes, sizes. We all know about it. Box trailers, uh, livestock or uh, bull wagons, we call them out here on the west side, uh, double trailers, container trailers, bulk trailers. There's a ton of trailers out there. Um, they're all either gonna hurt us or help us depending on what we're trying to do with that when we go to lift these things or stabilize them. Uh, your box van, your van trailer, this is the most common trailer in the United States. 
by far, whether it's dry on the left, you can see there, or if it's a reefer trailer on the right. Okay. Only difference in the two is one of them has cold product in it potentially, and they're designed a little bit different. So you got a lot of insulation in the reefer trailers, and then obviously you have that unit on the front uh, of the trailer there that controls the temperature inside. Um, and then you have insulated rear doors and things like that. Uh, when we talk about reefer trailers, you know, everybody always says, well, do I turn the, do I turn the reefer off if it's running when we, when we encounter these accidents? And I say, well, you better make sure you know what's inside of that thing before you go around turning stuff off. Because if you got a million dollars with the seafood in the back of that trailer and you shut it off and it's not even hindering your operation, somebody potentially may have bought that seafood because we went over there and shut it off. Eh, you know, if the tractor and the trailer drove into a wall and now that tractor is compromised into the reefer unit, eh, you're probably going to want to shut the reefer unit off because it's going to be in your space where you're working. Uh, but just use common sense there, folks, and we'll be okay. <clears throat> A good example of your bolt wagon there on the left and then your bolt trailers on the right. Eh, so now we start getting into some cylindrical objects. So stabilizing these things are going to be a little bit more tricky. Uh, pole trailers, container trailers. Container trailers are great. You can push off them. You can stabilize off them. They're, it's a great, great uh, trailer for us in the, in the fire service world. Um, the only problem there with container trailers is the attachment to the trailer itself. So you got the container that sits onto the trailer, and then it locks in with these little pins to hold it in place. So four, four uh, little knuckles that go in there and turn. Okay, that basically rest down it. And if you guys have seen these things going down the road, you know you have every single one of the tires on the trailer is wobbling around like crazy, and it's usually you've got no tread on it either. So um, these are the ones you got to watch out for. Um, they're pretty much banged up and bruised up and not the best shape going down the road. Uh, your fuel tank trailers, right, the upper picture there. And then you got your doubles or your westerns um, on the on the lower slide there. So two 28 foot trailers, your pup trailers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, your flatbed trailers, your your the upper picture there, you you start seeing them pre arched, right? So they're made of lighter weight steel or aluminum. Uh, put that pre arch in them so that when they're loaded, they can take that. Um, and again, the less that the trailer weighs, the more load they can put on top of it. Uh, then your low bed trailers on the bottom, your cozads, whatever they are for your heavy, heavy equipment, specialty permit required. A um, lot of weight probably on these trailers here. Uh, roll up doors. We'll talk about roll up doors. Uh, right. A lot of strength there. You can see in that picture, a lot of steel on the rear of the trailer. Uh, and then the door rolls up into, into a little groove there. Uh, when we talk about roll up doors versus swing doors, uh, well, people always ask, well, can you open the door to see what's inside? Eh. Yes, no, maybe so. If the roll-up door will allow you to, to go up, you're probably gonna be okay. Um, if it doesn't allow you to open it, <clears throat> then don't open it. Um, but these are great trailers here because they got that, that steel reinforcement along the back there. Um, great for uh, stabilization, pushing, things like that. Um, then you'll see the difference here in the swing doors, okay? Uh, these are the doors we caution you on trying to open at all. Um, so we don't know what was in there. Maybe the driver's in, uh, incapacitated and the whole load of that trailer shifted. And now it's just waiting for somebody to come pop that door. And basically those two doors are a shear wall in essence, like when we build houses and we break that open and then the whole trailer racks and basically falls apart, um, which is what we don't want. So we gotta be cautious on opening things. Drill a hole, stick a uh, first look 360 camera in there, right? Take a quick little vision of uh, what's going on or get up top um, and cut a hole with your saw and see what that load is doing. Uh, ramp doors on your specialty trailers, right? For all those uh, big dollar race cars, dragsters, and all that good stuff. Uh, a lot of different operating techniques go into these things. So if you can grab that driver, and for some reason you need to get in there, um, or the operator that knows how to use those, uh, you're going to be best best suited there. Uh, the Mansfield bar <clears throat> or the DOT bar, okay? It's basically a rear impact guard. Um, Jane Mansfield, very, uh, predominant actress back in the day. Okay. She actually was very unfortunate and crashed her car underneath one of these trailers and did not uh, survive. So the department of transportation said, I need you to lower the, your trailer height from X to Z. And I don't care how you do it. So they put these nice little bars underneath there. Okay. If you guys have been on one of these wrecks, you know, 
that all bars are built differently. All trailer manufacturers do it differently. Some of them fail and absorb the, the crash. Some of them hold true. Okay? And some of them don't do anything. You'll notice the space off the sides there. You got the two reinforcements kind of off-centered there in the middle. Um, but the, the exterior part of the DOT bar is left very weak. <clears throat> so the rear impact offset is what's going to get you, um, especially if this thing fails. So if it fails, you're going to get that depth up underneath those trailers, and that car is going to be buried underneath this trailer, okay? especially in California because we have a legal limit of 40 feet from kingpin to axle. So we have a ton of space between the DOT bar and the rear set of duels on the trailer. Once you go out of state, you can slide those axles back on that bogey system. So you're probably not going to get that um, that depth that we get out here on the west side. Uh, so be cognizant, um, but it also could be a lifting point, right? You can put some airbags underneath those posts and push off of those. Um, great attachment points for the heavy wreckers. A uh, ton of stuff going on there, but just physically look at it, right? If you want to use it, look at it, make a determination. Um, is it all rusted out, cracked? Well, I'm probably not going to use it. But if it looks true and it wants to hold, let's rock on with it. Uh, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, right? They're uh, doing this side underride uh, with the air deflection in it. So a little bit of protection for underrides on the side of trailers. Again, it costs money. So we'll see who actually invests in it, <clears throat> which trailers out there are actually going to spend the money and put them on the road. Um, but they're all doing good things out there, right? So it started with the, uh, the DOT red and white labeling. And then you now you got the underride bars or the Mansfield bars, and now you got side protection on trailers too. So it's a good thing. Um, hopefully we see it, but I'll probably be off the job by the time that stuff's on the road. A uh, great picture of the landing gear, right? <clears throat> Two jacks in unison working simultaneously. Okay? We highly recommend getting these things down when you guys roll up. just gives you some extra stabilization and a nice solid platform to work on when we're uh, going to work here. Uh, you can see the uh, couple pictures there, right? Anytime you start seeing angles on things, it's just there for reinforcement. So if for some reason you see that that stuff's compromised, we have a lot of tools on our trucks uh, to re-simulate that, i.e. struts, uh, wood, whatever it is, just recreate the angle with what we have and make it strong again, if so need be. Uh, all right, so after that landing gear there, yep, we're going to switch gears and go into the uh, five-step process now. Uh, where we actually get into the lifting techniques, stabilization techniques, and uh, have a little more fun. Um, we're going to dive into this little five-step process. Um, we're going to give a shout out to uh, one of the legends, uh, Billy Leach. Uh, unfortunately, passed away a couple of years ago, um, but he is the main emphasis behind this program. Um, he did a ton of work for us. Uh, we tweaked it a little bit to make it more um, follow suit to what uh, we believe in. Um, but overall, if you use this five-step process on these types of calls or any type of call where you have something heavy on top of something light that you're trying to get out, um, this thing works. So uh, let's dive right into it, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll get into um, some of the uh, intricacies here as we go through. Uh, so some, some of the objectives of this part here, the types of ex extrications okay, that we're going to encounter, um, some of the vehicle movement. A little bit of heavy wrecker orientation, which if you guys have been following us, we, we rely heavily on the uh, heavy wrecker uh, to do the, the some work here. Okay, But by any means, we're not going to stop what we're doing to uh, incorporate this heavy wrecker side. And then we'll break down the five-step process and go over uh, how we think uh, it should work. So some types of extrications, right? You got the smaller vehicle that impacted the larger vehicle and is now pinned underneath, okay? So an underride scenario, and then it has subjects trapped in the smaller vehicle. Um, we need to know these things, right? We need to read the wreck. We've all heard that term um, back in our, our days from passenger vehicles. We have to read the wreck, read the wreck and basically uh, figure out how this situation occurred to better help us understand how this person is gonna come out and or person soon. Um, and or the large vehicle was damaged from the collision. So I just have a commercial vehicle that was driving down the road, heavy vehicle, and crashed into something. And now I have to get that person out of the larger vehicle or the commercial vehicle. So in these first two pictures here, you can see this is just the uh, commercial vehicle, right? <clears throat> so standard cutting practices, 
spreading practices and pushing practices when it comes to extrication. And we're not going to get too much into extrication because um, it's what we think is, it's just like cutting cars, just making space. Pretty simple. Um, you can see there in the picture on the left, the large windshield area and what's converted into a larger area um, by cutting and spreading and all that other stuff. <clears throat> uh, the picture on the right, again, right, the whole truck and uh, trailer that looks like an, uh, an end dump. Um, crash, so really nothing with a smaller vehicle or a smaller object involved in that. <clears throat> okay, standard stabilization practices, um, lifting if you need to, and um, cutting, spreading, pushing, and all that good stuff. Now we get into the vault where, uh, or get involved with the smaller vehicle getting uh, wrapped up inside or underneath <clears throat> um, the larger vehicle. So, you know, was it the uh, passenger car's fault or was it the commercial truck driver's fault? You know, the statistics earlier in the, in the, in the show show that uh, the majority of the time it is the passenger vehicle. Okay. Well, I want to know what happened here. So the, the picture on the left where they, the truck and trailer making a turn and the smaller cars smashed up underneath it. Or like you can see on the picture on the right, maybe the smaller car was stopped and the larger vehicle came up from beneath it or in front of it and actually drove up on top of it, um, creating an override scenario, right? So the larger vehicle overrid the smaller vehicle versus the smaller car driving underneath the larger vehicle, underriding that scenario there, okay? So um, the energy transfer is a little bit different, you know, just depending on what's going on. And then the passenger spaces of those vehicles um, reduce drastically depending on what type of wreck. Uh, vehicle stabilization, right? That's why you guys are here. That's why you guys are watching. Okay. Um, stabilization, if you've ever been to our class, is stabilization and only stabilization. Okay. Um, we, we preach highly um, of calculating the weight. Okay. So I know I have to uh, use the proper tool. Okay. So I don't break things, hurt people, other things like that. But if we're truly stabilizing and just making something not move laterally, um, it shouldn't take too much. Uh, too much weight. But then the problem we get into is we're actually not stabilizing anymore. And we're actually trying to capture a load. So when we capture a load and we want to distribute it back down through the ground or to strut or whatever we're using, um, we need to make sure we have a weight calculation going on. And we're not talking engineer stuff here. We're talking down in the street, coming up with a weight um, and then just sticking to it. And if things change, then we'll adapt to it. Um, we must work within our working load limits, okay? So we all know our equipment has a couple different numbers in there and make sure we all understand what they are. Uh, some of the vehicle movement that we may be potentially dealt, dealt with, right, is up, down, left, right, forward, and backwards, okay? The six principal movements uh, in vehicle stabilization, okay? They're always going to be there and they're always not going to be there. So if the suspension is gone from the wreck, right, well, it's pretty much on the ground. It's not going to go down anymore. Um, so think about it, um, use common sense here, right? As we will approach these things, does it look like it's going to fall on me? Well, then I probably want to do something to prevent it from falling on me and or the patient, okay? Keep it from rolling um, <clears throat> forward and backwards so we don't get ran over by things, especially as we start lifting them and transferring um, energy and rolling parts, excuse me, rolling parts onto the ground that weren't originally on the ground now they want to they might want to roll on us and then shift the uh, shift loads and things like that so we've got to be cognizant of all these six major movements right <clears throat> so when we talk about shocking a vehicle right especially now a commercial vehicle right um we always think four by fours right we'll stick a two by four or four by four to keep that passenger car from rolling well now you look at the size of this tire okay um we're gonna need some more surface area to keep these things from moving so i.e the chocks off the fire trucks, okay, seem to be great because they're uh, designed for those types of vehicles um, and or just getting creative, right? Increasing the surface area that's in contact with the ground via wood, pickets, um, tiebacks, winches, anything basically to keep this thing from moving the way we don't want it to, okay? So you got to get creative. We say it in all of our classes, um, get creative with it because that look you do on the training ground is just never going to be there in real life. So don't give up. When the look's not there, just think of something else and stick to the principles and you're going to be all right. Tow trucks. All right. Our favorite part of the class, right? Um, utilizing them. Um, they have many uses. They do this stuff 
every day, folks. So we have to make sure we go out there and train with these guys. Okay. They do have limitations based off the size, all right, <clears throat> and or the operators. So uh, we'll touch on that here in a minute. Um, and we got to build that relationship before the call happens, right? <clears throat> so if I don't know that uh, X tow company um, has any operators that are worth anything um, before I call for them, well, then it's going to um, spell out a bad equation at the end of the at the end of the call, and then we're going to be wishing we never used them. Okay, there's a a lot of tension between the uh, private tow industry and the fire department for some reason, and I don't know why, but that's what we're here for. We're here to break down those walls okay, in that class and actually get these folks involved. Um, we're not LA City. We're not LA County. We're not Miami Dade Fire. We're not DC, where we have the luxury of having tow trucks in the fire department. <clears throat> so we have to rely on these private industries to help us out in these scenarios. They're all on rotation, depending on where you work and live. Um, for the most part, but we want to build that relationship and skip the rotation if we can. So I can call them and get them coming for a life safety uh, operation, not just a rotational um, recovery for them. Okay. Um, but keep in mind with the tow truck, right? They're used to recovery. They don't have people stuck in these things that are trapped. Okay. Uh, we, we need to let them understand that now we're, you know, people are going to be working underneath these loads potentially. Um, and all that other good stuff. So those little tricks that they do, we don't we don't want to make sure we get pinched in one of those those operations. Okay, and not all tow trucks are the same. Okay, we'll see that here in a minute. Um, and when we're lifting the larger objects, commercial vehicles, okay, the tow truck should be our number one option. But the problem is, if we don't have them in our organization or close by, maybe they're on another job, and okay, we're not just going to give up. But it is our option, and we want to order that thing straight out the chute, right? So as soon as the bells go off. Um, we, we, we get that commercial vehicle involvement. <clears throat> uh, we want to launch that tow truck and get them coming. All right? We can always cancel them. Um, and if you haven't split that call designation up in your, in your dispatch matrix, right? If you just get a regular MVA or a TC call, uh, do the dispatchers have a way to decipher if it's involving a commercial vehicle? Does it plug in a rescue company? Does it add another unit? Does it add the tow truck, right? Like those are things that we can do on our end to make this uh, rescue successful, okay? So smaller wreckers, right? <clears throat> and when we talk about wreckers, it's gonna have an elevated boom, okay? And a wheel lift of some sort possibly, uh, but it just doesn't have a flat bed. <clears throat> so a couple of different winches, right? Should have two if it's a wrecker at minimum. Um, and these are great little trucks that we can use to uh, move the smaller vehicle around once we do some sort of lift or capture on the larger vehicle. Uh, so we always say, uh, tow trucks on scene, uh, find something for it to do. Okay. Cause it's a great tool, great little winching tool. Um, instead of us getting out doing hand powered operations, things like that, grab them, stick them in staging, do whatever you got to do. Um, uh, and put one of our people with them. And you'll hear me talk about that later on in the, in the, uh, five step process. We don't want to let them run wild. We want them with some, uh, some, uh, basically somebody in charge them, steering them with what we want them to do. Uh, your rollbacks, right? Your flatbeds, okay? great, great tool. Uh, can you be used for an elevated platform if you have vehicles on its side and we need to work up at elevation, okay? And then also, again, smaller winching operations um, that we can use to uh, move some of the smaller loads around. So they all have different uses, but uh, we just want to be aware of what they can, can and can't do. Uh, your medium duties, okay? So again, elevated boom with a wheel lift underneath or an underreach of some sort, two winch lines minimum. It could have a third drag winch on it, just depending on who's running this thing and what they do with it. But we just got to understand what the working load capacity is of that truck. And they're all different. So that's why we've got to establish that relationship before we go or ask, all right? Well, maybe we asked for a heavy and all they have is a medium available. Well, what does that medium do? So go back, make a binder, in your station, right? That has all your local uh, record companies there and, and know what those trucks look like, know their overall distance, their weight capacities, right? Their width. So when we make, when we ask for them to show up, they can actually do the job that we're asking them to do. And then we get into our heavy duty records, right? Straight sticks. Okay. Um, <clears throat> limited in reach. Okay. With our booms, but overall still a good truck um, to use here. So they use them to tow commercial vehicles all over the place. 
Uh, the, the only problem with these trucks is you gotta you gotta work them off the rear of the truck, okay? And then again with that limited reach of the boom, uh, but still a great tool uh, to use uh, to uh, lift some heavy objects, okay? Versus us trying to figure out um, something that's in our playbook that we're just not really comfortable with or haven't trained on it enough. Uh, the best option, right? Your heavy duty rotator, 360 degrees. Okay, a lot of these sliding, they can slide the boom all the way to the rear of the truck. Probably the most versatile tool that you're gonna find on the street there is less than a crane, which you're probably never gonna get a crane unless you live in uh, Germany and work for Germany, the fire department, things like that. They have these things in their playbook um, and they're great tools. So um, I like options. So I like to get as many as I can up to five winches um, on a, on a heavy duty sliding rotator, okay? And they're all different capacities from 40 ton to 100 ton, 110 ton. It just depends on the manufacturer and who wants to uh, play in this realm here, okay? Um, limited reach on, of some sort and they can slide. And then usually these folks aren't towing with them. So they're not uh, they're not towing the vehicles when they're done. They're just recovering them. And then they'll let the, the other trucks, the smaller trucks actually tow them back to where they need to go. <clears throat> Uh, there's a couple pictures there, right? Again, sliding rotators. A uh, little shout out to Waggies out on the uh, East Coast. Uh, they do a ton of work for us, um, help us out in the fire department. And then we got Epler towing here in uh, Madera, California. Again, great resources. They they love training with us. So reach out to these folks and just see what they can do and what they can't do. Um, and you guys are going to be better off uh, successful down the road when you need them. Uh, a couple pictures there, right? You can see the uh, boom height, uh, multiple winch lines of some sort, right? Uh, you got the short jack picture on the side there. So they're just short jacking the one um, one side because only working off one side. Um, but a lot of different um, variations and a lot of applications that we can use here with these tow trucks. And like I said, the sooner we get them coming, uh, the better off we're going to be. Um, even if we don't use them for our rescue operation, we want to use them, um, which you'll hear me talk about later, is breaking down the scenario that we did lift because I, I just don't think the fire department's in the business of lowering things, especially at upwards of 40, 80,000 pounds. <clears throat> right? They can pick and swing. Um, they can pick the whole thing up, spin it around the truck, get it out of the way so we can work. Um, just very versatile. Um, 80 ton rotators, 100 ton rotators, just a great overall tool for us. All right, <clears throat> so the five step process is why you guys are all here, right? Again, Billy Leach from Big Good Rescue. This is his his program, and I like it. Um, and we and we appreciate from what he did to the fire service for bringing this here. And we just tweaked it a little bit. Um, so step one, right? Identify the cargo of all vehicles involved. Okay, so do I have a bus that's on top of a Honda Civic? Okay, I need to know that. So, and in this identify the cargo, right? We want to come up with a weight of some sort. Okay, it doesn't have to be exact, but we're going to break it down based off what we showed you earlier on counting axles and doing axle weights um, so we can basically judge what equipment we're going to use. All right, two, stop the crush from the larger object or vehicle. If we can do one and two, and that's all we get. We have done these people so much good, it's not even funny. Okay? We've prevented this larger weight or object from crushing down on that victim anymore. That's huge. Okay? They're not going to just sit there and crush to death. Okay? So we stopped it. And now we're going to come up with a plan to either get them out or create a lift of some sort, um, which will bring us into step three, which is lower the smaller object or vehicle. So notice how we say object or vehicle, it may not always be something that rolls down the road. Maybe something that's rolling down the road because it's on back of a flatbed trailer, i.e. a concrete pipe, a vault, another something heavy on the back of a truck okay, that fell off that truck and or just in something at a construction site, right? You can use these five steps for anything that's heavy on top of something light that you want to get out. So can I lo lower that smaller object, right? And <clears throat> we'll talk about that here in a minute. Step four, Lift a larger object, right, which is the fun stuff. Okay, now we're lifting heavy, heavy stuff um, off of the lighter stuff, and, and we're going to gain some separation and, uh, and get these people out. Uh, step five, separate and extricate. Okay, 
So when we talk about that, right, it was, well, can you go in there and do a trunk tunnel, cut the roof off, get in there to about as far as you can underneath this heavy load and then do some extrication? Maybe, I don't know. But if we did all that without doing number two, I guarantee you that person there is going to suffer. So um, we like separate and extricate if you're good and you're, um, and you're quick at it, right? And you have all the tools to do it. It's still an option. So we want to actually separate the two vehicles pull it apart, maybe get it out to an area where I have 360 degrees to work. And then I let my extrication team smash that thing. And this person's out and off to the hospital in a matter of minutes versus an hour or two. Right? <clears throat> so in that step one, right, identifying the cargo, we have a couple of different ways to figure out what's going on, shipping documents, placards, talk to the driver. Okay? If you live or work in California, I can tell you I've been on calls where the driver of the truck is completely gone. His truck's in the middle of the freeway. The brakes are not set. The truck's still running. And you have no idea how this truck got here because that driver is gone. Okay. So you got to be careful. They're not always a reliable source. <clears throat> uh, the shape of the container, we talked about it earlier in the presentation using the ERG, right? Well, is it square? Is it round? It may help me on identifying what's going on. Uh, the labeling on the vehicle itself, right? Um, we want to figure out the number of occupants that are potentially trapped and or are trapped. Okay? And then which vehicle are they trapped in? The larger vehicle or the smaller vehicle? Okay? And which one are we going to get out first? And we'll let you make that decision on scene. <clears throat> so then in that step one, right, identifying and calculating the load, we're going to use what we learned earlier and okay? using the industry accepted value of axle weights. Okay, So we know the thin profile steering axles on the front of a truck, 12,000 to 18,000 pounds, depending on what kind of truck it is. And then we get the larger tires, right? <clears throat> on the front axle, all the way up to 20,000 pounds, our cement trucks, our uh, fire trucks, right? That fat tire that's in the front, okay? we got a lot of weight on that steering axle. Okay? Uh, and then we can also use the DOT rated tires, okay? They all have a max load rating stamped right on them, single load rating or max load rating that single or max load rating dual configuration figure out what it is, what kind of configuration it's in, add them all together, and that's the maximum weight you can put on that axle. Okay? And then we're going to use that to uh, determine what we're putting underneath there to push on these things or stabilize them. Good picture of your thin tires there on the left, right? And then you got your super singles on the right. Okay? Same thing, it's just 20,000 pounds per axle or 17, depending on what kind of figure configuration in they're in. Um, and again, right, we can get by one tire or four tires, um, depending on what we're gonna do. So it's all about efficiency and what that company wants to run on their trucks. Basic truck weights, right? Three or less axles, 55,000 pounds, four or more, 66, okay? And then five or more, 80,000 pounds, okay? That magic number of 80 just popped back into this, the presentation. Okay, a lot of weight, but I'm not really worried about too much because I'm going to leave the majority of it on the ground when I go to lift it or stabilize it. <clears throat> There's that great slide one more time, right? 17, 17, eh? total of 34, add them all together, gross weight of 80,000 pounds, 51 feet long. So <clears throat> at zero degrees, eh? now we're going to get into a little bit of street math here. 50% eh, of the vehicle's weight must be moved for the upriding force initially. So now we're going to take that 80,000 pounds that we just saw here, eh, and we're going to lay it over on its side. So when we do that, it's going to require 40,000 pounds to initially bring that truck and trailer back up to its original location. Okay, So we'll say we're going to roll it or do a hinge lift. And okay, so... Right there off the bat, I just took an 80,000 pound load and I cut it in half <clears throat> based off of physics, okay? So I can deal with 40,000 pounds all day long versus 80, right? Yeah, we got some things that'll push 80,000 pounds, but I like the half number way better than I do 80. So this is where that mass is gonna come in, right? <clears throat> so here's a great picture of it. So that truck is and trailer is rolled over, okay? So I only need half of that to get this thing to start coming back up to create some space. Say we had something trapped underneath there, right? Um, <clears throat> so half is easy to work with. But again, what I want to caution you on is this: you'll see a lot of people uh, try to spike these things and, and do different techniques of, of rolling trucks, right? Um, we want to get underneath, 
So you see where the arrow is to the, the right of this slide here. Okay, that's where I want that force being applied. So furthest away from the fulcrum, which would be the tires in this uh, situation, and or the wood that I filled with, creating contact with the ground. And then if we wanted to add a little bit of help and, and rig a, a spike roll or a winch line that's going to actually attach to that upper axle that's up in the air and spike it down to the ground and, and, and assist it, um, that's okay, right? But if we don't want to just go grab that thing up high and start yanking on it with a winch because, A, we could drag a load, or B, we could get upwards of 100% of the load or 110% of the load if we just if we're not careful with our, our winching operations. So we want to get an initial pop from the ground up and then assist it as we're going around it. So um, an another great tool here. So at 15 degrees, right? So now we're going to say that truck that was on the side is now sitting at a, you know, 15 degrees off there. So I only need 75% of the initial force. So now I take that 40. It's got a, we'll say it's got a little Honda underneath there. So it's already sitting on an angle for us. Perfect. Just helped me. That's an angle that's helping me. So now I took that 40,000 pounds and I cut it down to 30. I can deal with 30 a lot easier than I can with 42 when it comes to struts, um, airbags, bottle jacks, hydrofusions, winching. It's just a less, a less a reduced weight that I can manage more easily. And then we'll even go down even more to 30 degrees, right? And then we'll say it's just sitting on something else and it's got a better angle for me. So now I only need half of that. So now I'm back into 20,000 pounds. And then at 45 degrees, yeah, I only need 25% of the initial force. So now I took that 40,000 pounds and I dropped it to 10. I'm in my ballpark all day long. I can push 10,000. I can stabilize 10,000. I can do a lot of things at 10,000 pounds. So those are angles that are helping me based off the way that that heavy load came down onto that lighter load. <clears throat> so uh, stopping the crush, right? So you, you guys have heard it. Well, you may have to stabilize it. Well, are we stabilizing? We're preventing it from doing this and then falling over? Or do I want to stop the crush because it's a, it's already falling over and it's just crushing somebody? So there's a little bit of difference here in my mind um, and the stabilization piece is just is that in itself so if it like i said earlier if it looks like it's going to fall on you you probably want to stabilize it or is it just dancing there ready to fall let's just keep it there for now and not let it fall on me or did it already fall over and now that that weight is pushing down right i want to stop it from uh, basically doing any more damage okay so if the stabilization piece looks like it needs to be done, this is part of that step in that step two. But if we initially we want to stop that crush or that weight just bearing down on that victim, eh, that's going to give them a chance of survival there. And mechanical struts or timber, timber cribbing will be the tools. Eh? And I know you folks all on the East Coast versus the West Coast, you guys carry way more lumber than we do. Um, and, I, and I give you props for that. Uh, but <clears throat> we got we got struts and other things we can use to, uh, to uh, take that place there. Um, again, heavy tow trucks are going to be my my resource that I'm going to call right out the chute. Okay? And then I got to calculate the load so I make sure that everything's going to be in play for what I'm doing. Okay? So some examples of stopping the crush, right? <clears throat> Everyone's going to look at these pictures and go, well, is that thing actually stabilizing? No, because if I, for instance, take the picture on the right, which is a bus rolled over, is it stable as it lies? Absolutely, okay? but there's a void there, and I want to prevent that void from coming down anymore. We'll say in that scenario there, one of the victim's arms is outside the window and being crushed by the bus. So it could be as simple as a four by four and a four by four wedge driven in strategic locations. You notice where they're at along the rivets of the roof line there because there's reinforcement underneath that, that sheet metal, okay? and we just send them home. Okay. and let that thing stop the crush from coming down on that victim's arm potentially anymore and then we'll figure out how we're going to lift this thing up if we have to or lower the uh, lower the smaller object uh, the picture on the right you'll notice our struts okay for stopping the crush are 100 percent vertical okay that is the quickest most efficient <clears throat> excuse me way to get a strut in and stop the crush if the wreck allows it, okay? There's no angle involved in that type of wreck. So again, um, frame rail, 
in contact with the strut and then the other strut end is going down to the ground to the surface okay if the surface is not good then we may have to put some cribbing under there to distribute that weight and so forth but again it's just going in there down and dirty tightening that collar and preventing this thing from coming down okay? i'm not really necessarily worried about lateral movement i just want to keep the weight from coming down anymore Get creative. You guys heard us talk about it earlier. Eh? Well, that picture on the left there, <clears throat> a simulated load shift, right? In the trailer is bulging out of the trailer over the casualty. We have to get creative and support that thing so it doesn't just blow out of that trailer and then come down onto our victims that are pinned into that, that vehicle. Okay. Um, so a simulated raker system would change a, a spar of, of timber and a couple of paratech struts there, right? Anchored back into the other side. And we're just supporting that bulge in the trailer. Um, and that's part of that step one as you're identifying the load and you're doing that 360 on the wreck as you're looking down the objects, right? If there's a bulge in trailers, you need to identify it because we may have to go inside that trailer and do some work before we start lifting this heavy object off of the lower object um, so it doesn't shift and then we lose it all and we, we don't do any good there. Um, the picture on the right, <clears throat> again, right? If you need some... Uh, some vertical support in the middle of the trailer due to the trailer um, rails failing, right? You can just get creative as you want, brace it off with your uh, your struts there, um, and give your give your trailer some support. <clears throat> uh, step three: lowering the smaller object or the car, right? So sometimes the weight of that vehicle has compressed the smaller vehicle so much that we're not able to lower it anymore. So we'll say a uh, under ride, right? A passenger vehicle under the side of a van trailer. Okay, so the weight of the larger vehicle is just not gonna let that small vehicle come up because it weighs more. So the suspension of the smaller vehicle has to be compressed, okay? And keep it compressed when we go to lift the larger vehicle. All right, so after we do our step two of stop the crush, we're gonna go in there, we're gonna secure the suspension on the smaller vehicle, if it is a vehicle, and we're gonna keep it compressed, okay? And then as we go for our next move, which is gonna be, well, we'll see if there's air in the tires, okay? Well, if you guys have been to my class before or our class, okay, uh, you know, anything that has air in it, we like to grab that air and stick it in our back pocket and maybe use it later. But if it is your option and you wanna make it quick and it's there, it's going to allow you to get some separation by all means use it now don't wait for it at the end okay but there's a lot of uh, thinking that goes involved versus just rolling up and pulling bow stems out of tires right and um, if you do remove the air from the tires the smaller vehicle's tires before you capture the suspension you did nothing you just move the suspension to the ground and you're not going to get any separation so think about it before you get crazy on it all right so there's some good pictures there, right? Um, the red strap on the picture on the left goes from rim to rim over the hood of the vehicle at that 12 o'clock orientation on the rim of the passenger uh, vehicles. And I'm gonna compress that suspension and hold it down, okay? And you also notice the suspension on the picture on the left there of the bigger vehicle is in play here, okay? So people say, well, do I need to do anything to the larger vehicle suspension? And um, we will tell you, Absolutely, if it is in play. If that's the part that's impeding on my victim, we're going to have to do something to get some separation. Okay? So whether you're lifting it with high, uh, hydrofusions, airbags, a heavy wrecker, or whatever, if you're not lifting from that suspension component of the heavier vehicle, you're going to have to overcome that travel if you're lifting from a hard point such as the frame, the cab or some other portion of the, the heavier truck, but it's just going to settle down and we're not going to get any separation. And okay? so there's a lot of moving parts that go into this suspension um, as long as they're either in play or out of play for whatever type of wreck you go on. Uh, you'll notice the picture on the right there from uh, talking about securing suspension of the smaller vehicle. Again, rim to rim up and over the deck lid. They got some actually got some four by fours over there to uh, basically keep that weight and the tension of that strap off the back window okay, and from popping that window, which is okay if you like to, but I like to keep that passenger space as encapsulated as I can um, before I actually have to get my people out. So that way I'm not um, bringing the outside elements A into them or exposing them to uh, what we do as rescuers with passing tools, such and forth uh, over the top of the vehicle. 
uh, step four, lifting the larger object, right? <clears throat> this is where it gets a little complicated if we don't do it enough. Okay? It's best to accomplish with the heavy wrecker. Again, the emphasis on the heavy wrecker, but guess what? We're not going to sit there and wait. Okay? We're not fortunate like some organizations. So we're going to come up with a plan and use this five-step process, and we're going to we're going to uh, tackle this thing. And it can be accomplished with multiple options: cribbing with high-pressure airbags, cribbing and bottle jacks, mechanical lifting struts such as hydrofusions, um, and so forth. Okay, uh, what object? What the object gives us? The landing gear, which we talked about in the first presentation, right? Those jacks on the front of the trailer that go down and up. That's a great lifting device. It's designed to lift the weight of the trailer. Okay? And you'd be surprised on how much it'll lift. It'll lift the tractor rear axles right off the ground with the trailer attached to it. Okay? The suspension that has airbags on it, right? The trailers that have air ride, the tractor that have air ride, all things that are on the object that we can use if we understand them to create some sort of lift and or separation. And then we have sliding axles, which we'll get into here in a little bit on the trailers itself. And then simple machines, right? Anything that can be basically used to lift um, and or separate with. So when we're lifting it, right, we got to reevaluate our initial stabilization. Okay? So I think there's three steps to stabilization. There's primary, uh, secondary, and then the tertiary side of the stabilization, which is that constant reassessment, right? So we come in with our primary, which is uh, our wood, right? Our, our shims, our wedges, our, our two by fours, our four by fours, keep the things from moving, rolling, doing whatever. And then we come in with our secondary, which is going to be our struts, our, our lifting struts. Um, chains, winches, grip hoist, um, any of that fancy stuff, ratchet straps. And then that, again, that third side is just that constant reassessment because now we're going to start lifting things. So whatever it looked like when we got there is not going to be the same when we start pushing on it. Okay. We have to account for and we've got to locate CG, right? Center of gravity. It's a hypothetical guess, but if you can take the majority of the weight um, and, and figure out where you're going to be pushing, um, we have to basically try to figure out where that CG is so we don't get behind it or in front of it and cause undue stress and or lose the lift. Okay. Lifting the larger object, again, right? The number one resource, heavy wrecker, okay? Know the type, know the access, make sure we leave space for them, okay? Don't bottleneck the freeway with 20 different fire, fire apparatus and call for a heavy wrecker and then they're sitting there back, back there about a half mile away blaring the horn trying to get in, but we didn't leave them any space, okay? So if we're gonna order it and we're gonna use them, we gotta make sure we leave enough space for them, okay? Great tool and understand their limitations. The Paratech strut multipliers, right? <clears throat> okay, I said it earlier and I think I've said it, said it a couple times. Angles are gonna hurt us or they're gonna help us, okay? So I'm not gonna get all nerdy with all these numbers, but <clears throat> a strut that's loaded vertically is strong, okay? A strut that has an angle to it and loaded is not that strong anymore. Okay, the forces go other places, so it goes down and out. Okay, uh, Paracheck did some math for you, um, so there is some little equations that you can put on there uh, to basically figure that out if you're that smart. I'm not, so I like to do street math. It's either hurting me or helping me or doing both. Okay, depending on the situation. Uh, lifting the larger objects, the hydrofusions, right? We're pretty fortunate here. Um, we've been able to put scales underneath our lifting devices, our capture devices, our stabiliz stabilization devices, um, and get true numbers, right, based off of weights um, and what's going on. So, again, in this picture here, that hydrofusion is straight up and down, right? It is vertically fashioned um, to do with the maximum amount of work, okay, in that uh, setup there. Um, so I challenge you guys to go out there and see what angles do to your equipment um, when you guys are training and, and basically come up with conclusions on whether you're going to do operations that way or a different way um, and have fun with it. Right. Uh, but be safe at the same time. Um, and you can see true numbers and evaluate your equipment in the best fashion that you can. Tiebacks. You guys have heard it probably numerous times. Okay. Um, we got to tie stuff back. <clears throat> so if you look at the picture on the left there, right, we got a hydrofusion lift and low, okay, on the outside of the box of that trash truck. And then our capture strut is right next to it, the gold strut, okay. 
but we got a lot of mass above those struts, right? Does that everybody agree with that? We got a low insertion point, okay, with our lifting device and our capture device. So it's really not giving us much stability because I got a lot of mass above that. So the tie backs on both sides are going to prevent the lateral movement, okay? And then the lifting strut and the capture strut are basically doing our lift and preventing anything if something failed from coming back down on us. And it's giving us a little bit of stabilization because it's got a slight angle to it. Um, and you can almost see that hydrofusion is pretty much straight up and down. And we're trying to give it its maximum lifting capacity and send that load straight up, okay? Or straight and rolling a little bit like a hinge lift component. Um, tie backs, right? We want to be using our grip hoist um, or jet pullers. Uh, ratchet straps are an option, okay? I don't like things that stretch with heavy vehicles. Uh, but they are an option if that's all you have. We've got to make sure we leave enough material on the barrel of a ratchet strap to go both ways. So you have to be able to tension it and you got to be able to let some out as that lift goes up with that tie back. Things might get tight on us and we may have to relieve some of that pressure. So um, a lot of different stuff going on, um, but tie backs are paramount when we're lifting things. A uh, couple different configurations there. You'll see the hydrofusions underneath there. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been to a class and said, you know, your struts, your your lifting struts have to match the, the, the angle when you're lifting. And I'm like, well, I would like to agree with you on that, but I'm just not able to do that in some of these scenarios, right? When you get a wreck that's underneath a heavy load and I just can't get that look and I still need to lift, I'm I'm going to do what I can do and I'm going to get after it. So you can see the one, we'll start with the picture on the right. Okay, the, the, the hydrofusion is pretty much straight up and down. And then you have the one to the left of that, which is off-centered a little bit, and it has a slight angle to it. Well, it's okay, right? The one on that's going straight up and down is doing the majority of the work, and the other one's just chasing it up, okay? keeping everything um, symmetrical, I guess, is what you want to call it. Um, and then we always get the question of, do I want to level the load out? I'm like, I don't know. That may be part of your plan. Um, I like to leave it as it lies and just take it away from the lower object um, if we can and keep everything the way it was. Because when I start trying to straighten things out and I, I'm doing a lot of uh, physics that um, I'm changing the way the loads are being applied to the, the strut heads and things like that. And, you know, it might be in your plan, but it might not be. Um, and then you take the picture on the left there. Right. That looks like almost textbook that you see in the pictures. All right, um, you know, the struts are pretty much matching angles, but that load from the heavier truck, which is on top, is pretty level. Okay, so in that scenario, yeah, if you can get those struts into a place that allows your angles to match, well, then have at it. Okay, um, but when you don't have the space, you just get creative with it and stick to the principles. Don't get too far behind the CG and uh, lift the vehicle the wrong way um, and, and have fun with it. Um, again, we're going to lift the game of 16th now in the heavy world because we're going to do a real good job of capturing suspension on the, on the big vehicle and the smaller vehicle. Uh, so if we do a good job there, then we should only have to lift it a little bit to get the separation we need to pull that victim out or then go in there and do some dash work on the smaller vehicle uh, to allow that person to come out. So we're not looking for inches here, folks. we got heavy loads, so we just want daylight. Uh, some other options to lift a larger vehicle, high pressure airbags, right? <clears throat> Great tool. Everybody in the United States usually has some of these. Um, how you use them is going to vary depending on the departments. <clears throat> uh, we like the uh, series lifts. We like putting bags um, in series with Ys. Um, so I push one button and they all do work at the same time. Um, and then we control them with the, uh, obviously the inline uh, relief valves that uh, we put on the bags there. Um, nothing's wrong. Nothing's right. Um, some people prefer different ways. Uh, but again, great tool, but limited height capacity, depending on what we're actually lifting weight wise. Um, but it offs absolutely great tools. Uh, here we have a, a dual hydrofusion lift with the picture on the right and the left. Um, and they're just chasing with the gold struts there. <clears throat> uh, so People may ask, well, is this a chain cradle? No, absolutely, it is not a chain cradle. Um, it is attached, the chains are attached to the lower side of the vehicle. Um, we want to attach the frame on the downstream side if possible, right? <clears throat> um, so you're probably not gonna get this look initially 
if this bus was all the way on the ground. But what you have here was with that white sedan underneath the vehicle. Um, it, it gave us enough space to be able to get our rigging all the way underneath the lowest part of the bus and attached to a hard point on the frame uh, on the dirty side of the vehicle. <clears throat> Coming up and then going into our strut heads uh, via the hydrofusions, our lifting device, and then our chase struts, uh, the gold struts. Uh, basically taking the place of the cribbing, right? So we about have enough, about enough cribbing on our vehicle to uh, maybe get us a lift of six to 12 inches. Um, I know there's uh, departments out there that carry upwards of 100 pieces of wood. So kudos to you guys. Um, <clears throat> you guys can do a lot more with uh, wood than we can. But if you guys are out of wood or you run out of wood, you can always take that place with the, uh, the struts there and just uh, put about... Uh, 25 pounds to our struts there and we'll just let the air maintain um, contact <clears throat> with our load and we'll just chase collars just like we would with cribbing, uh, lift an inch cribbing inch just with collars and we're off to the races here. Uh, you can see we uh, we put the scales there underneath there too. We're pushing on them so we can see weight transfers. Um, so good good little things out there to, to do and see. Again, right? unorthodox moves with your hydrofusions um, straight up and down on the picture on the left right 90 degrees i, I like it um, it's tied back on both on both sides um, and it's going to go straight up that's, that's the way i want it to depending on the wreck right um, you can see that angle of the, the gold strut on the picture on the right there right that's a perfect uh, stabilization angle right 45 degrees okay but um, where is it placed on the vehicle to the truck bed that tilts, right? So do we take that in consideration? Do we chain down the dump bed of the dump truck, right? Cause I'm asking it to do something for me. I need to make sure that it's all going to react appropriately if something did fail. Uh, you can see those steep angles on the, the picture on the left there, right? That's a, that's a nice hydrofusion lift, hydrofusion bottle jack on steroids. I love it. It's got protection in the collar, right? But that's, Angle is pretty shallow, right? From what everybody would be uh, seem normal, right? but the load's in the way. So it is what it is, right? Now I just have to understand that chart that Paratech did with the angles, right? And know that my load is going down and out <clears throat> on, on, the, on my struts versus down and through the ground. Yeah, it's totally okay as long as we know our weights and what we're pushing and, and, uh, and everything's reacting correctly. So. Again, getting creative, right? Then you see the picture on the right, heavier vehicle. Now I bring my strut, strut angles in tighter and ask that thing to do more work and push it straight up and down into the ground. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another, another option, great option is uh, um, high pressure airbags on top of the tires, right? In between the tires and the box of the van trailer. Uh, this is a very rapid lift, <clears throat> again, However, you guys set up your airbags, um, put a little bit of uh, cribbing or pad on top of the two tires, okay? especially if this trailer is fully loaded. So if we walk up and the driver's there and he's like, yep, I'm fully loaded at, you know, whatever it is, 70,000 pounds. Okay? If I take 70,000 pounds in a box trailer, which technically should only have 34 back here on this axle, on these set of axles, and I put one airbag on two tires, what do you think is going to happen to those two tires? Well, they're probably going to fail, right? Because it's designed to carry the load on all two, four, six, eight tires. Okay, So if it's fully loaded, we want to put an airbag on top of all four of them and then inflate that. And you get a good, nice stretch out of the suspension on those trailers. Um, if it's an older trailer, leaf spring trailer, uh, you'll probably get four, six inches. If you get the air ride trailer, yeah, you're probably going to get upwards of six to eight inches of, of separation off that um, smaller vehicle. So great, quick way to get some separation and or maybe just stop the crust. Just fill the void with an airbag, um, air it up, <clears throat> stop the crust that way, and then figure out how you guys are going to lift it after. Uh, but this technique has been used multiple times throughout the U.S. Uh, and successful. So uh, the old bogey slide. Uh, uh, <clears throat> right, if you've been to our class, um, basically what we're doing here is sliding the axles of the trailer. Okay. Um, and we'll see in this video here, they're using a grip hoist attached to the DOT bar okay, with a two to one configuration for mechanical advantage. And they've created an inclined plane with four by four wedges behind the tires on all axles. 
we released the brakes, released the bogey pins, and they winched the whole axle back up onto this incline plane and basically lifted the trailer right up off of the smaller load, which is a car um, underneath the trailer. Great technique, takes a lot of practice, uh, but it is an option that's out there for us to explore. <clears throat> Another option, I know uh, the grip hoist has been highly talked about um, throughout the years. Uh, these, these devices are awesome. If you're not running them, um, I highly suggest getting your hands on one of them and basically just taking the place of uh, a, a winch that we don't carry on our trucks. Um, but this is a hand powered winch, right? Um, the, the ones in the picture there, uh, the TU32, 8,000 pounds on a straight pole. And then you can see all the mechanical advantage that's being incorporated into it. So allowing us to move potentially 32,000 pounds. Um, if we got all the pulleys and anchors and all that other good stuff, great tool. Um, it's my favorite tool for tiebacks, um, but it can actually, in this scenario here, right? If you're quick enough with it, you could stop the crush with the grip hoist and then turn it into a lift at the same time or a roll. Um, but great tools out there. I highly suggest getting your hands on them and, and playing with those. Uh, load cells again, right? We're, we're pretty fortunate. We got scales and load cells. Um, it's just like the rope, the rope nerds out there, right? Putting those load cells in your rope system. Them, gives you true numbers because um, true numbers are good numbers uh, so you know what you're putting on your equipment and your anchors and stuff like that so if you have them you know go ahead and throw them in the mix but uh they are very pricey so be careful on spending your budget on those things uh, we talked about it earlier in the in the presentation you know our glad hands um so this is our kit here to basically take over the air system on a van trailer okay whether it's a reefer or or a dry van, um, you'll notice the color coding going on there. The red, right, is your emergency, and your blue is your service side again. So we have glad hand adapters, right? Um, you can get them at any truck stop in the United States and then convert them over to your whatever um, airbag system you're using, right? Uh, we have a regulator there, a single dead man, um, and then some inline relief valves to control air in and out. <clears throat> so we can actually take over the air suspension the brakes on the trailer and so forth and uh, release pressurize uh, inflate airbags and so forth. If we don't have the tractor there to uh, allow us and assist us in doing that. So cool little system that we've, uh, we've built there. Um, it works great. So, and then we get to that uh, number five, separate and extricate, right? This, in this process, um, the patient care is paramount, right? Um, I don't know about you guys, but we we got to put that, those people in with those people with those victims, and talk to them if they are talking, and just make sure we're watching all that as these things come apart, because uh, there are people out there that don't like moving vehicles with people in them. Um, but it's okay if that's our option, then that's our option. Let's stick to it and let's get after it and make things happen. Okay. Uh, trunk timing again is an option, right? We're not saying anything here is a must. Um, but at any point you get to something in your five-step process and you're done and you can make the extrication, then stop and have at it, right? We're not telling you, you have to go all the way to five. If you get to one and two and you make the grab, then you're, you're good, right? There's no reason to lower the smaller vehicle. And obviously there's no reason to lift the larger vehicle if we can just stop it and then get them out. So, um, don't, don't be fooled. Don't let us think, don't, don't, um, uh, don't get in your head that we're making you go through all these five steps to, uh, make everything look cool. Um, they're just there. So if one doesn't work, you go to the next one, the next one, and it just flows nicely. And then hopefully you'll have a successful, uh, a rescue there. Um, so it may be better to remove the smaller vehicle, right. <clears throat> and give us some space to work. Okay. Um, when we are pulling vehicles and doing winching operations, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Okay. There's resistance and in, in things that do not move or do not roll anymore or are stuck in mud um, on slopes and things like that. So we're going to break that down a little bit more here uh, just so you guys can see the numbers that we're going to be playing with. All right. So here's a video of a separate and extricate. So these guys did a lift. And as simultaneously as they were setting up this lift, somebody else was setting up um, the uh, separate, the winching operation. I mean, this is flawless. Uh, I want to say this was done in a matter of 15 minutes 
from when they set up to lift and separate. So it's pretty good, right? But you notice in the video there, um, they took the rolling resistance out of play because we took the suspension out with the ratchet straps. So the vehicle wouldn't roll anymore. So now we got rubber on concrete, rubber on asphalt. So there's just a lot of resistances that we have to calculate. And again, I'm not expecting you guys to memorize this stuff, but just know when you start pulling on things and it doesn't move the way you think it's going to, that this is why. So roll in resistance, right? <clears throat> That's me having a tire roll down on a hard surface. Okay, I have to add 5% of the overall weight for something that's rolling, okay? Softer surfaces like mud, grass, gravel, now I get 15% of the overall weight, okay? And then if now if the thing is damaged, the rim's gone, now I'm just dragging eight arms through the mud or on the concrete, right? Now I'm gonna put 66% of the overall weight. So the weight is just drastically increasing based off of the resistance that I'm meeting when I'm pulling these vehicles out, okay? Meyer resistance, right? Is it mired, right? It's stuck in something, so mud. Tire depth, 75% of the overall weight. The wheel depth, 100%. And if it's all the way down to the body, okay? So for everybody that, when you get your, um, when you get your truck stuck and stuck to the frame, you got 150% of the overall weight that you're gonna be pulling on, so. Think about where you're attaching things. Think about your mechanical advantage going into your winching operation. Think about the anchors that you're setting up for change of directions for a winching operation. So things can get bad real quick here if we don't understand some certain things uh, when it comes to resistance, right? And then obviously we have gradient too. So we've got slopes, right? <clears throat> so gradient resistance should be added or subtracted to the surface resistance to calculate the winching power needed, okay? Um, the reason we do this and we talk about it, especially in our classes, is everybody says, oh, yeah, I got a 12,000 pound winch on my rig. And I'm like, cool. Um, how, <laughs> what's the, the receiver rated for that's on the rig that the winch goes into? And they're like, oh, 8,000. I'm like, awesome. Well, you bought a 12,000 pound winch to go in an 8,000 pound receiver. Um, so now you have an 8,000 pound winch. Okay? And then where is that maximum pulling capacity? At full wraps on the drum or five wraps on the drum? You tell me, okay? Now we got some um, grades that we're gonna be uh, dealing with here, right, potentially. So you guys can see the numbers here. I'm not gonna go into all of them, um, but 15 degrees, I gotta add 25% of the vehicle's weight going uphill, right? And then if it's going downhill, I gotta subtract. So again, common sense and physics, right? A little street math is gonna either help us or hurt us in some of these situations. All right, thank you guys again for, uh, listening to me for the last uh, hour or so, two hours. I'm not sure how long I talked for. Anyway, I uh, hope you guys got something out of it. Uh, again, we want, just want to say thank you to our partners in this, Paratech, uh, BA Products, Hamilton Blake Safety out of Vegas, uh, Bill's Towing, Epler's Towing, uh, all the instructors that work for Blue Collar Training Network that are constantly uh, taking time away from their families and work to uh, get this information out to you as students. Um, we appreciate that. Uh, also, big thanks to my wife, Monica, and my two kids, again, for uh, allowing us to uh, do what we do and, and pass on this information to uh, the fire service. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And again, thank you. And uh, give us a shout out if you need anything. Who wants to do, Mike? Joe? Hi. Thanks for joining us and uh, welcome to the live Q&A. Uh, you're going to be uh, on here with uh, myself, Mike Uliberry, uh, the Western Regional Sales Manager, as well as our training manager, Nigel Leatherby, and our guest today, Jeff Acola. So uh, we'll go through some of the questions that we received uh, prior to and uh, during the webinar. And the first one will start with a question about the working load limit of uh, grade 80 chain in reference to stabilizing uh, tandem axle, axle vehicles. Um, but I think, Jeff, let's just go ahead and address uh, that uh, load limits as well as covering uh, grade 70 and uh, 100 chain as well. Yeah, great question. Um, with the different grades of chain, right? Uh, typically we'll use our grade 70 chain for just securing loads. 
uh, maybe capturing suspension, anything that's not really incorporated into our lift or stabilization. Um, and then we've, we've kind of gone away from the grade 80 chain um, in, in our world just because the grade 100 is about 25% stronger and it's about the same price. Um, so you might as well just switch over to the grade 100 um, for your overhead lifts and your, your stabilization and such. Um, and with that, you know, we're talking about the, the axle weight back there on the 34,000 pounds. I believe the question was referred to as doing a basket under the rear of the trailer. Um, so if you actually break that, that lift down into the weight, you know, like we discussed in the slides, um, you know, we'll say 34,000 pounds is on those rear axles. I'm going to cut that number in half immediately. So you know, 34 and a half was bringing us back down into that, into that realm of the basket uh, rating of the chain. Only thing I don't like about baskets, right, is the you have a, a DD ratio in your chain, just the way it's loaded. Um, um, so you could you could technically you know overload your chain based off of the, the DD ratio in your chain because it's point loading chain links. Um, but it's still a good technique. It's rapid, especially if there's no purchase points for you to get under hard points um, to do any of that stabilization or lifting. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question we had uh, was from uh, Lee Brown, and it uh, is about stabilizing uh, the barrel of the cement truck and uh, how to secure that and chaining it before uh, we do a lift. Nigel, are you answering that one or you want me to do it? You can do it, Jeff. That's fine. Yeah, so the, the, the drum on the uh, on the cement mixers, right, uh, there's usually one fixed point uh, where the drive unit is at, that hydraulically driven uh, motor that's attached to one end of the drum. Um, that one really isn't too critical, um, but we always want to look at all that stuff when we're sizing that up and that step one of the process, um, just make sure it's all holding together. Um, the opposite end of that drum, right, there's a couple rollers there that basically gravity is holding that drum onto the rollers and allowing that drum to spin, um, we definitely want to chain that end of the drum back down to somewhere in the stinger area, if it has a stinger, um, and or the frame, uh, and then tension it up with a chain binder so we don't get any movement of the drum uh, while we're upriding it <coughs> or just stabilizing it. Um, and it's a good little, you can, you'll see if it's rolled over, when you guys are doing that size up, that 360, you'll see a gap uh, pretty predominantly present in between the rollers. Um, and a lot of questions we get also is, well, do I want to bring that back into the rollers? I don't like moving things. I'm going to fill the void with uh, some wood or, or whatever, and then I'll, I'll bind it then. So I don't like to move things back without um, actually until I want to move the actual load itself. So, yes. Okay. Uh, the next question comes in at, uh, let's see. When uh, stabilizing a uh, heavy load with struts, uh, do you prefer a high insertion or a low insertion point and, and why? So that's a great question. Uh, and, and you brought up the, uh, the key word in that, in that question was stabilization. Am I truly stabilizing for lateral movement prevention? Am I, or am I, capturing something right a load that's already leaned over and i want to capture that weight um, if i'm stabilizing i'm just stabilizing so i'll go as high as i can all right as long as as long as high as the wreck will allow me to go with my strut angles just to prevent that lateral movement right and those struts will hardly see any weight um <clears throat> so as far as low insertion points right you you have to keep in mind if we're going to stabilize low on a low insertion point i have a lot of mass above my stabilization my uh my insertion points which is not good in some in some aspects um so you may have a mixture of both um i can't tell you you know uh, something that's going to be true every time because it all depends on the wreck but traditionally you'll see us do low lifts so low insertion points um and low um capturing devices and then if we need that lateral prevention we'll add those higher insertion points for the uh, stabilization factor as we're lifting. Okay. Uh, the next question. Uh, when doing lifts of a trailer on an underride, 
Are we teaching to uh, bind or secure the springs of the car and the trailer before we make the lift? Yes. So uh, suspension, you heard you touch on it in the presentation, right? Is it in play or out of play? Um, and is it actually going to hinder my operation, right? So if I'm trying to get separation from a point on the vehicle that's further away from the suspension and it's not going to uh, impact my extrication or separation component, I, I may not have to do anything with it. Um, but if it is in play where it's right in focus, the, the suspension is focused in the energy or the area um, where I need to get that separation, I absolutely have to chain that, maybe block it out um, with wood. Um, so when I do lift from a hard point on the truck or the casualty, that I bring that suspension component with me from zero, right? I don't wanna lift six inches on a hard point of a frame and get zero separation off that suspension component. I wanna bring that suspension with the lift. Um, so whether we're rigging to the suspension, right, with an overhead lift, that's that's one great thing to do. And I'll just bring the suspension with me from zero and, and we're done. Um, but yes, absolutely, we have to take that suspension um, into our equation. Um, to figure out what's going to what work best for us. Okay. Uh, let's bring another question in uh, back kind of to our chain discussion on uh, how we would use uh, ratchet straps versus chains on the D-ring handle of our base plates. Excellent question. So we all know the D-ring that's on the, on the bottom of the Paratech base plate, right? Um, it has a swivel component, which is the luxury that I like in that uh, in that product. It doesn't want to bring the base of my uh, strut base off the ground and lose that surface area. That's the one of the be the benefits of the Paratex system, um, as opposed to other strut bases, where as you take tension that ratchet strap up, it lifts the base off the ground, and I only have a small portion of the base on the ground that I'm actually using. Um, and as far as soft versus hard, um, you know. Pretty much the light world, so your passenger vehicles, you're going to get away with a ratchet strap, you know, 3,300 pounds, um, 10,000 pound overall limit. So those are going to work out great in our light, um, our light situations. And then when we get into the medium situations, our box vans, things like that, we'll just double up the ratchet strap or get a greater um, size ratchet strap switch from a two inch to a four inch um, and then once we get into the heavy world we're going to switch that device out to a chain right typically grade 100 is what we're running uh, most of the time now and i'm going to have that attachment point <coughs> onto the d-ring with the chain um, you, you've probably seen some new chain configurations that we're running out there with a closed safety hook <coughs> that attaches to the d-ring on the paratech base and then allows me to use my grab hook on my chain to go from chain to grab hook and vice versa back over to the other base um, whatever your tensioning device is whether it's a binder or you're just getting it as tight as you can and then taking that play out and taking the slack out with the strut heads there's a, a lot of different options when it comes to that but we definitely are going to chain the bases uh, of on our heavier loads Okay, great. The next question is uh, about the landing gear and is it rated to lift a fully loaded trailer or uh, only the empty weight of a trailer? Excellent question. Yes, yeah, so it all depends on the trailer itself. So your typical van trailers, the landing gear is 100% rated to hold the full capacity of the contents and the trailer itself so you have to consider that when you see these trailers sitting on the side of the road with no tractor underneath them okay, that jack system is designed to hold that full weight the thing that's missing right is the tractor that goes under there and that gives you another thirty-four thousand pounds of uh, load capacity on the axles um, plus the steering axle right we don't want to overload the steering axle um, but yes that jack is designed to hold that on that type of trailer so it'll lift the whole weight <clears throat> up and down um, but then you get into some of these um, liquid containing trailers where those jacks are not rated to hold the full weight of the trailer. So if you typically see a fuel trailer with no tractor underneath it, that, that trailer is empty. Um, so those jacks are not just because of the weight factors. 
that are in the fluid in the fluid trailers and, and things like that. But every trailer manufacturer is different. Um, so to sit there and tell you all of them are rated, um, I, I wouldn't want to lie to you. Um, but you just have to go out and do your homework. All right. Uh, another question we have would it, uh, would you recommend building a load indicator into your lifting system? Yes, that's the the million dollar question for uh, for Paratech since they're all online with us, right? Like, what what can I get the most out of my product? Can I get the hydrofusion with the safety collar and a load indicator all in, in it at once? Yeah, that's perfect, right? If the engineers could do it, um, what they have done is on the pump itself. Um, if you look at the gauge on the pump, you can get pretty close to your uh, your weight that you're pushing on that on that hydrofusion just by taking the outside number, which I believe the color is black, um, whatever that number is on the pump, and then doubling that, so multiplying it times two, and you're gonna get a rough estimate of how much weight you have on that individual strut. Um, if you could have access to your your um, your scales and all that stuff, I don't recommend buying those for um, you know emergency operations just because it's just another piece in the component. Um, and I know we do it in the rope world, uh, but if you have it, yeah, I mean, absolutely put it in there because then you know what you're pushing. You know, you're, there's no guessing here. Um, you saw on some of the other slides, too, we have load cells that we can put into our rigging devices with our grip hoist. Again, high dollar items. But if you're in the business of doing uh, correct rigging and, and things like that and knowing what you're actually pulling, then, yeah, absolutely um, buy those things and incorporate them into your systems. Okay. Uh, we have a question now uh, about the grip hoist, uh, and it says, uh, can you discuss at some point rigging the grip hoist to the axles and any procedures that need to be done to secure the axle for being pulled uh, off in a hinge lift, uh, as was in the, the PowerPoint? Yes, I believe that was Allison that answered or asked that question, and I think you're referring to the picture of the cement mixture that's rolled over with the dual three to ones with the grip hoist. Um, yeah, we want to stay away from pulling on suspension if we can, right? But is the truck empty or is it loaded? If it's empty, yeah, we have some options to cut corners and pull on things, but you are 100% correct. If we're pulling on suspension, it, it naturally wants to separate from its attachment points. So you may have to go in there and get some chain and, and uh, bind that axle back to the frame itself to keep from pulling that suspension component of work. Um, if we can go to the frame or go up and over the drum, that's what we want to do. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of stuff to go in that go, goes into those those critical um, roll maneuvers that I think you're talking about. Uh, but yeah, if it looks like it wants to pull apart, we're just going to prevent it by adding more chains. Okay, good. And I think another thing to bring up with the grip hoist too, like that, that is definitely, and I know you mentioned it in the, in the PowerPoint too, that's a preferred method uh, to have your tie backs in place because once, once we get the load on the hydrofusion strut, I mean, the center of gravity from that object is going to want to find itself again. And that's a great way for your tie offs. Um, also, when you are doing a, a bogey slide and I showed pictures of the stabilization uh, back to the landing gear, um, it is always a good idea to throw a strut up in there against the, the brace on that and the floorboard um, just to kind of secure that a little bit too as you put that force on the grip hoist as you're moving those bogies forward. Um, another question we have here are, uh, is there a standard glad hand operating pressure? Yes, so your uh, your glad hands are all going to have the same operating pressure as the truck and trailer itself. So 120 to 130, depending on what your cutout is on the truck. Um, all that is going right through that system of flexible hoses, through the glad hand adapters, and then back through into the trailer. So 120, 130, right? If the system's running correctly, and then obviously as features get used throughout the operation, that pressure is going to decrease, especially if we eliminate the compressor from the tractor feeding that sure um and then uh, i have a couple other questions here i'm going to refer these ones to nigel um do the paratech straps lose strength if they are wet uh, or in the snow or cold 
Uh, they don't lose capacity whether they're in snow or cold, but when they wet, they yes, they do. Uh, uh, as in any other ratchet strap, if it's soaking wet, it does lose capacity. To the extent the capacity it loses, I'm unsure. But they are a they are a nylon belt, so it's not as if the water soaks in. But they do lose capacity when they wet. Yep. Uh, and uh, the last question I have here: um, Does Paratech have any oversized bases for use on soft ground? Uh, not really. The only bases we have is a twelve by twelve base. That's the biggest base we do. If we need any extra padding under that base because of soft ground. We pad it out with plywood or even an airbag, a deflated airbag, just to pad out that base, just to give us a little bit more surface area on soft uh, ground. Okay. And uh, we do have one more question that just came in. Uh, what's the capacity of the D-ring on the Paratech uh, bases that we've been referring to? That's a good question because that gets, gets asked a lot. So the D-ring rating is a 5,000 pound with a four to one safety on the D-ring. So basically it's a 20,000 pound D-ring, one to one. Yep. Okay, that's great. Looks like we hit uh, all the questions. Um, on behalf of uh, Paratech, I'd like to thank uh, Jeff Acola for spending today with us and doing this webinar. Um, and thank all of you for taking time out of your day to uh, participate in this uh, training session. Um, we look forward to having you attend the ones that we have in the future coming up. Um, again, thank you for uh, tuning in. Jeff. Thank you all again. Uh, appreciate the time and uh, hope you guys learned something and hit us up if you guys need anything else. We're always free to answer questions. Um, we like sharing information. So again, thank you and uh, have fun out there. The road has been long. Through time, Paratech has worked tirelessly to always keep innovating and making the best tools to save lives. Now, on the cusp of a new era, we are entering the future of rescue. Before facing the future, you should know the past. Let's go back. The real start to Paratech was the saw. Partners Robert Banker and Howard Leibovitz discovered the Swedish chainsaw that they thought would be effective for the fire service. And that proved to be correct. And that took off in all over the United States. It had to have special blades. Howie Leibovitz, he invented a negative pitch that nobody else could replicate. So we began making those ourselves. That's what gave us the manufacturing core to Paratech. We had this capability and now we wanted to fulfill it with new products, new ideas. It all started back in 1962. Our first ever tool was the Pryax. The Pryax was uh, developed by a battalion chief in New York City Fire Department. He had what he thought was a prototype for somebody to make it for him. This was while I was in the Army. My two partners, Howie and Bob, agreed that they'd like to try it. The first run was 2,000 units. When I got out of the Army in 1965, my first task was to get rid of these damn Pryaxes because they're costing us a fortune sitting here. Little by little, they gained recognition and we started building in improvements to the tool. And each time we made a release of forgings, we tried to incorporate a features into the tool that would make it better. Every change in the tool was an improvement. The tool that started it all over 50 years of continuous production and continuous improvements. World famous Pryax. From one innovation to another, Meet the hooligan tool. 
the fire departments had very limited choices. Some fire departments were doing forcible entry with a crowbar that they got at the Ace Hardware store. So when, they, when they'd when see this quick and decisive forcible entry tool, that was a fairly quick success. And we did send thousands of them. We used to weld them, but the weld wasn't as good because it was damaging the structure of the material. So we pressed this. The first three-piece production Halligan tool and the first to improve upon the original Chief Halligan design. I designed new claw and new head, so it's more practical. Claw is more sleek, but it's bent more, and it has a nail pulling feature. The head, it had two wings like on the side of the pike. When you hit it in a metal lead in a car, you could twist and you open up the hole, so it become a completely different tool. And the hooligan tool has a major place now in fire departments. Recognizing the need for new innovative firefighting tools, the Beal tool. Howie wanted to design this very small personal tool. Spell it backwards, it's Leib. Leib, Leibovich. That's what he wanted, so I had to do that. <laughs> he wanted to have a Beal tool. And that's the name. A few years ago, I redesigned that again. It's cast out of stainless. It's very strong, stronger than steel. It's like 180,000 PSI. All we do is put rubber handle on it. We just press it together, so this is like indestructible. The smallest, most portable axe in a fireman's arsenal. Designed by Paratex founder, Howard Leibovitz, to ensure that even officers have a tool they can carry without restricting personal mobility. Something completely new, the PRT. The idea behind it, it's the economy of scale and it's safety because up until that time to get percussive force, you're swinging a sledgehammer and you take a back swing and it's dangerous. You're able to direct all the force. There's no deflection. I wanted to make it lighter and more modern. I developed the one with the aluminum housing, so it was lighter, it was more efficient, and there was a special lock that when you turn, you can lock it in a different positions. All of the force that is being expended is directed at the point of the tool. The ultimate disaster preparedness tool. No strings attached. Safely direct optimum impact exactly where you want it. New problems require new tools. Titan crash hacks. The lightest, most advanced personal rescue axe. Designed with and for the pararescuemen, the PJs, U.S. Air Force Special Operations Command. This was the first product I worked on. Some members of the, the Air Force pararescue guys had bought, um, had purchased one of our Beal tools and they had tested it without us knowing about it. And they said, hey, we really like this product. Here's the thing, we need the whole thing to be under two and a half pounds because everything that goes up in an airplane, the weight matters a lot. That's why you never drive to titanium. Like we started that project with full-size pencil sketches to clay models, to 3D models, to th like, man, I had, a, I had a whole Tupperware container full of 3D prints of just tweaking things and changing things, and the whole thing is skeletonized, kind of trellised out so that provide a, a really strong grip with gloves and gets the whole thing under that two and a half pound limit. Engineered to be as light, strong, and customizable as possible, the only X of its kind. Having refined our manufacturing and engineering expertise, we move to revolutionize another plane of rescue. Our road continues. The future of rescue still awaits. 
Come along next time when we uncover how Paratech made a yellow X mean the safest rescue. I went to work and I said, Howie, why did you hire me? And he said, because you're crazy. <laughs> I like guns. <laughs>